Welcome back, World Warriors, to part two of our Street Fighter retrospective. If you missed part one, then a card for it is popping up right now. In that premiere episode, we talked about how the initial idea for Street Fighter was born, the long, turbulent development of the second installment, including how it almost became the beat em up icon Final Fight, and how Street Fighter 2 exploded. Yeah, Street Fighter 2 didn't just give birth to the fighting game boom that dominated the arcade for an entire decade, but for multiple years, this game and its various spin-offs remained the number one title at arcades around the world. This was a success almost unheard of in the world of video games, and it helped Capcom grow to the company that we know them to be today. So that raised the question, what to do now? Well, that was obvious. Make a sequel. When your game was that successful, that well known, with so many fans clamoring for more, the only thing Capcom could do was create Street Fighter 3. Capcom proceeded to not make Street Fighter 3. Yes, after Capcom found themselves with a massive, explosive success in Street Fighter 2, they made some rather odd decisions with where to take this franchise. What? Capcom making odd decisions with what to do with an incredibly successful franchise? I know, as hard as it is to believe, there is a time in which such a thing happened. So today, we're going to delve into these decisions and see exactly where this series went after Street Fighter 2. Hello everyone and welcome back to part two of our four part, uh, five part, six part series. Yeah, <laughs> okay, I'll just start by saying that originally this series was going to be only four parts. I had everything mapped out. I knew exactly which games I was going to be covering in every single part. But the more that I began to investigate the stories behind these games, the more I realized yeah, I'm going to need some more episodes. So I want to thank everyone who tuned in and supported part one, and I hope that you look forward to the next five parts because, well, just speaking personally, it gets kind of surprising at times. And if you are enjoying these retrospectives, but you haven't yet subscribed, we're trying to hit 80,000 subscribers by the end of the year. So if you want to help us hit that number, go ahead and click that subscribe button right down there. On the last episode, we talked about Street Fighter 2 and the monumental impact that it had on video games, and how it gave birth to the fighting game genre. But after you put out something this big, this influential, this important, after you put out something that takes the entire world by storm, what do you do next? Well, that's what we're going to be taking a look at today. Today's episode is about the interesting directions that Capcom would take this franchise in between the second and third installments. It's about a time period in which Capcom was experimenting with new art styles. It's about inventing new mechanics. It's about teaming up with new developers for bold new ventures. It's about... Not you. You're going to get your own spotlight. You are too much of a mess to fit into this episode. We're going to save you for a later episode, so let's all just look forward to that. But before we can think about the future, we have to move into the past, with the first big continuation of the Street Fighter series, Street Fighter Alpha. Now, a lot of people will tell you that Capcom made this game because they were trying to ride on the success of the Street Fighter movie. Again, not you, saving you for later. 
No, I'm talking about the animated film, which is actually really damn good. I'll talk more about this when we do an episode focusing on all the movies and shows, but I'll just say, if you were a kid in the 90s who loved Street Fighter, this movie was living rent-free in your brain. Iconic scenes like Sagat fighting Ryu in that field during a storm, M. Bison pulling off his cape and telling our heroes he'd fight them on their own level, Chun-Li smacking the crap out of Vega with a couch, this was what you pictured when you thought of Street Fighter. So, many people think that the Alpha games were made because Capcom wanted to make a game building on the success of this movie, by including many of the characters from the film, changing the art style to look more like the movie, and including iconic scenes in the game's story. That's not what happened. No, Street Fighter Alpha's origins came from a much less hyped source. This game was born from the bane of all inventory managers, Overstock. Remember in the last episode how I said that between Hyper Street Fighter 2 and New Challengers, the graphics in the game saw a massive bump in qualities thanks to Capcom upgrading their hardware from the CP System 1 to the CP System 2? Well, the CP2 was doing great for Capcom. It was making all their games look so crisp and clean, so Capcom wanted to promote it as much as possible. So they reached out to arcade developers and said, Hey, you still got some CP1s laying around? Send them back to us and we'll send you a CP2 system. And so, arcade developers took them up on this. A lot. A little too much, in fact. Yeah, Capcom found themselves now flooded with CP1 systems. So, that means that they had far too many CP1s and not enough CP2s, right? Nope, because Capcom figured they would get a surge of returns, so they created a ton of CP2s ready to go out. But they created too many! So Capcom now had an overstock of CP1s, as well as CP2s. I want to make sure we all understand what I just said. Capcom promised to exchange CP1s for CP2s, and people took them up on this, more than Capcom expected. And yet, they still had overstock on CP2s, meaning Capcom made so many CP2s that no matter what happened, they would still have overstock. Sometimes doesn't it feel like Capcom was maybe just making all this up as they went along? So yes, Capcom was swimming in CP1s and CP2s, so much so that legendary Capcom game designer Noritaka Funamizu said that he was sick of looking at them every single day. So they had to figure out a way to get rid of all of them, meaning they needed to come up with a game that could run on both the CP1 and the CP2. So hey, Street Fighter was their best-selling arcade game. How about we just make a brand new Street Fighter? That would move these units. So yeah, this game started life simply as a means to clear out their warehouse. But they needed an idea, something unique. They couldn't just make another version of Street Fighter 2, which is probably the first time anyone at Capcom ever said that. So Capcom was finally going to be forced to come up with a brand new Street Fighter. But not the next Street Fighter. Yeah, it's confusing why Capcom decided to finally make a new Street Fighter and not make it Street Fighter 3. Maybe it's because they didn't want Street Fighter 3 to be something that would run on last-gen hardware, but it could also be because Street Fighter 3 was... kind of... already in development. But we'll get into that in the next episode. By the way, I realize that I have already teased a lot of things coming up in future episodes. That's because this was a very weird time for Capcom. When it came to Street Fighter, they were approving pretty much any idea that landed on their desk right now, so there were a lot of irons in the fire right now. The point is, they needed this to be a brand new Street Fighter that wouldn't be Street Fighter 3. Well, recently, Capcom had hired several new artists and designers, one of whom was Naoto Kuroshima, who would come to be known by his pen name, Bingus. For one of his first jobs at Capcom, Bingus drew for a magazine art of all the fighters from Street Fighter 1 reimagined to have a more modern style. Well, these designs caught the eye of C.G. Okada, one of the lead programmers throughout Street Fighter 2's life and he approached the aforementioned Noritaka Funamizu and suggested that what if, for their next Street Fighter, they brought back all the Street Fighter 1 characters, but now in this art style and essentially remade Street Fighter 1. Meaning that even back at the very beginning, Capcom was still all about remakes. So after seeing these sketches from Bingus, they decided they wanted to return to the first game, which is why originally the game was going to be called Street Fighter Classic later being changed to Street Fighter Legends, and then finally selling on the name Street Fighter Zero. However, as you can guess from the last episode, Capcom USA just loved to rename everything that they could back in the day, and they felt that the name Zero was a bit negative. It implied not good or nothing. 
So since this game was going back to where the story began, they decided to name it Street Fighter Alpha. And yeah, I have to side with Capcom USA on this one. I think that is a way better name. Especially since Zero comes before One, but this game was actually going to be set between One and Two, so it's more of Street Fighter One and a Half. So there you have it. Street Fighter Alpha was not made because they were trying to make a game based around the anime and movie. It was made because they really needed to get rid of some hardware that was piling up and because the developers saw some fan art that they thought looked cool. Yeah, kind of crazy that back in the 90s, you could make a whole game just because of a reason as simple as that. However, that was the last part of the game that would be simple, because making Street Fighter Alpha was about to be the most ragtag mission anyone at Capcom had ever taken on, because heading up this project was Seiji Okada and Noritaka Funamizu, two veterans for Capcom and for Street Fighter. But the rest of the staff was made up almost entirely of first-time developers, Capcom had just hired several new employees and they decided that Street Fighter Alpha would be their testing ground. One such employee would be Hideaki Itsuno, a fresh-faced brand new employee at Capcom who had previously worked on the arcade quiz game, Quizzes and Dragons, but that was pretty much it. So of course, Capcom decided to make him the third planner on this game, right behind Okada and Funamizu. The planner, for anyone who doesn't know, is basically the person who maps everything in the game out, including characters, the look of the game, the concept of the combat, essentially they decide what the game will be like. And that was the position that Itsuno now found himself in. A guy who had just gone off of his very first job on a quiz game, now was the third planner on the follow-up to the biggest fighting game of all time. Well, clearly, the work that he did on that quiz game must have really impressed the higher-ups at Capcom if they were willing to trust him on such an important role, right? Nope. Funamizu decided to make him the planner because he came in early every single day. Was it because Itsuno was dedicated to doing the best that he could at Capcom and he wanted to make a strong impression? No, he came in early every single day because there was a Neo Geo at Capcom HQ and he wanted to play King of Fighters 94. I'm not kidding. Yeah, here's the big thing about Street Fighter Alpha's development that you need to know. Not only was most of the staff new hires for Capcom, but they were only given three months to make this game. Yeah, you heard me. They had to get a brand new installment of their hottest property out in just three months, with a staff made up mostly of people who had never made a game for Capcom before. Why did they have to get this game out so fast? Weren't you listening? They were up to their necks in CP1s and CP2 boards. They wanted to get those out the door quick. So when Funamizu headed into Capcom looking at everything they had to do for this game and with such a small inexperienced staff, he literally just saw someone in the break room playing a fighting game, not even a fighting game made by Capcom, and he said, hey, you seem to know this genre. Want to help us organize everything? And this was no picnic for Itsuno, because according to a Polygon interview in 2020 about the creation of Street Fighter Alpha, Itsuno said Funamizu would often pull him aside and tell him, quote, Man, you've got no talent. And apparently he told Itsuno, you have no sense. So many times, Itsuno came to hate the word sense. And you want to know the kicker? During that Polygon interview I just mentioned, they also interviewed Funamizu, and he apologized to Itsuno. Not for the way he treated him, but because he doesn't even remember that Itsuno worked on this game. Funamizu literally promoted him to the role of planner, having never met him before, and then proceeded to hurl insults at him every day without paying attention to who he was. Noritaka Funamizu, the J. Jonah Jameson of Capcom. So, for those of you keeping track at home, this wasn't normal video game crunch development. This was the I had to promote the first person I saw and didn't have enough time to remember their face kind of crunch. Well, Funamizo might not have remembered Itsuno, but Itsuno remembered him. And not just because of all the insults. No, you see, as bad as this was, it was through Funamizu that Itsuno learned about game development, and specifically about fighting mechanics. He learned how every move has a purpose and is meant to be used in a specific situation. So they had to think about this when they designed the game. And these lessons stuck with Itsuno because in case you're wondering, hey, that name actually sounds familiar, 
It's because Itsuno would go on to be the creator of Rival Schools, Power Stone, the best Devil May Cry games, and of course... So yeah, I'd say he learned a lot in this trial by fire. So, to summarize, Street Fighter Alpha was going to have to be made in three months. Maybe the shortest development for any game we have ever covered on this show. A good chunk of this staff, including one of the leads on the game, were brand new to Capcom and mostly new to the video game industry in general. And they were going to have to work on brand new technology while figuring out how to make it also run on inferior technology as it had to run on both new and last gen hardware. Oh, and one last thing. Remember Okada? The guy who was the seasoned pro who worked on Street Fighter 2 and was also one of the three planners? Yeah, he wasn't even supposed to be working on this game. He was supposed to be working on Alien vs. Predator, but he knew this game was sunk if they didn't get more help, so he literally started pulling double duty behind the scenes. So they didn't even really have three planners on this game, more of two and a half. But there were a few silver lines in here. For starters, working on older hardware was mostly a downside, but it did mean that this game would be easier to port to home consoles. At the time, the CP2 was stronger than what most consoles could match, but the CP1 meant that this game could still be ported to the Super Nintendo, not to mention the upcoming Sony PlayStation, meaning it was guaranteeing sales down the road for home markets that other arcade games would miss out on. And also... Actually, no, that was it. That was the only positive to all these problems. Yeah, this sounds like one of the most nightmarish developments in fighting game history, but in the end, this team was able to pull through and hit their deadline is a crazy thing to say. Yeah, no, they did not hit that deadline. You cannot make a fighting game from scratch in three months. It's not happening. Development would end up taking six months, although the majority of the work was still done those first three months, and all of this still just sounds like it's lying up to be a mess. And yet, what would get made would be something unique, something new, and it would end up launching a whole new generation of Street Fighter fans. Street Fighter Alpha was released in arcades in June 1995, almost a year and a half after the last version of Street Fighter 2, the longest gap so far between releases since 1991. Which might have been another reason why this game was only given three months of development. Capcom had never gone this long without a new Street Fighter and they were starting to go through withdrawal. And I remember when I saw this game in the arcades for the first time, I was shocked. It's a new Street Fighter! It's not like a new Street Fighter 2, no, this was an actual new Street Fighter with a new cast and a new art style and completely new gameplay. We'll start with the art since it's the first thing that you'd notice. As you can see, the characters have a far more animated look, making them far more distinct and help them to stand out even more than they already did. They feel more active and interject. A lot of people refer to the Alpha series as when Street Fighter became anime. Which is a totally valid take, not just because the quote-unquote anime style is very apparent in these character designs, their portraits, their ending cutscenes, but also because this look for Street Fighter kind of blew up and would go on to influence multiple future interpretations of these characters. I mean, just speaking personally, whenever I think about what Street Fighter characters look like, this is the first thing that comes to my mind. Now, as I said, most people say Street Fighter Alpha was made to take advantage of the popularity of the Street Fighter 2 anime movie, but as I discussed, that's not really why it was made. However, one of the arguments that people make for this is the art style. They say they went with a more anime look because they wanted to feel like the movie. This is once again kind of overblown. There is definitely influence taken from the animated film in some of these character designs. For example, Sagat is no longer as lanky as he was in the last game and is now a super massive muscle man like he is in the film. And the same thing can be said for M. Bison, whose suit is so inflated it looks like it would pop like a balloon if you pricked him with a needle. And I have to point out in Ryu's stage, you can see a poster for the film on a convenience store in the background, so the movie definitely influenced these designs. But the game was always going to have an anime style even without the film. As I said, one of the inspirations for this game was Bingus doing mock-up designs for how the characters from Street Fighter 1 would look if they were in a modern design, and the developers at Capcom loved this idea, 
so they hired Bingus to be the main illustrator for this game, so film or not, this game was always going to have a more anime look from the start. But the distinctive art style of the Alpha games extended beyond the characters. The stages still look good, although they were pretty basic in this first game. You can tell they definitely had to cut some corners compared to the stages in Super Turbo. But the UI elements are really strong and stand out, especially the icons that you get when you win. The game will now use different little symbols to let you know how you won the last match. And I love that if you beat the opponent through chip damage, then the symbol they use is just a piece of cheese. Yeah, this game actually tries to poke fun at you for cheesing out a victory, like, yeah, sure, you won, but we're still going to shame you for it. But speaking of that, let's talk about the gameplay, because if you saw these characters and thought, okay, it looks different, but I know Street Fighter, I can easily hop into this, well, maybe not. Because, yeah, it was still a six-button fighter, characters still had similar moves like the Hadouken and the Shoryuken and the Tatsumaki, all those were still the same. But the way that the basic combat itself worked was completely different. The goal of Alpha was to simplify the gameplay. Funimizu explained in that Polygon article that they felt the barrier for entry for Street Fighter had become too high. Remember, this was an arcade game, an arcade king, meaning every arcade across the planet had that one group of regulars who did nothing but play Street Fighter, and they were dominating the scene keeping new fans from being able to play because they couldn't challenge these pros. Sure, they could try playing the single player arcade ladder, but the moment one of these arcade killers came up and put their quarter on the machine, you now had to leave and go to the back of the line because there was no chance you were going to beat them. So they wanted to come up with a game where even the less skilled, more casual players could still do cool stuff, where combos were easier where there were far more defensive options, basically a game that could put players on more of an even playing field. So the next time that you complain about a modern day fighting game simplifying itself to be more accessible, just remember, this is literally what the fighting game genre has been doing since the dawn of time. It is going to be okay. These games will get crazy and overly complicated again, and the cycle will always repeat. First off, they wanted to make pulling off combos easier, so that way you didn't have to memorize the exact frame data of different moves. So they adopted a chain combo system, just like Darkstalkers, which was proving to be incredibly popular for Capcom at the time. What this meant is that you could now do combos just by quickly scrolling from one button to another. It didn't work for every button, and every character still had different timing and had different possible chains, and you could go beyond just the regular chains that the game gave you to experiment and create new stuff for yourself, but the important thing was, now anyone of any skill level could do impressive combos, and this game introduced several defensive techniques. For starters, you could now air block, another takeaway from the popular Darkstalker series. This was another way of leveling the playing field. New players are far more likely to jump, so now they could do that without the fear of a pro who could do a short Yukon in a nanosecond punishing them. You could also roll if you got knocked down to help you get some distance away from the opponent, making it harder for more experienced players to keep rushing you down and constantly being in your face. However, the most distinctive defensive technique was the alpha counter. If you're blocking and holding back, you can then roll the stick from back to down and press punch or kick to smack the opponent off of you. This would become one of the defining features of the Alpha series, and to this day, people still refer to any ability that knocks an opponent off of you while blocking as an Alpha counter. But the ability wasn't free, it would cost you one bar of your super meter. Luckily, you now had plenty of that to spare. Yeah, moving from Street Fighter 2 to Alpha, we went from one super bar to three. Again, the Alpha series was made to help new players feel good. And nothing feels quite as good as firing out super moves so why not let players do that more? And you could use up these bars quickly, because every super, of which characters now had multiple, had a level 1, level 2, and level 3 version. You could do these different versions depending on how many buttons you hit when you pull the attack off. So if you hit 1 punch, then you would do the level 1 version. 2 punches the level 2, and 3 punches made you do the level 3 version. These different levels would of course do more damage, but they would also sometimes have different properties making them good for different scenarios. So those are the ins and outs of the Alpha Combat. As you can see, it's very different from the gameplay of Street Fighter 2, and I know that saying this combat was designed to make it more accessible and to lower the divide between skilled and new players makes it sound like I'm criticizing this gameplay, but no, I love the Alpha games. 
As I said, a lot of changes took inspiration from Darkstalkers, and just in case you haven't seen our Darkstalkers retrospective, I'll let you in on a little secret. I freaking love Darkstalkers! And yeah, that love extended to the Alpha series. I love how fast this game moves while not feeling insane like Turbo. I love how chain combos are accessible yet customizable. I love the various uses of the multiple super meters. Yes, the game did get simpler and easier compared to the previous Street Fighter, but at the risk of upsetting FGC Twitter, having one installment of your game getting simpler and easier from the previous one isn't always a bad thing. And it all flows together and feels smoother, and I love that about it. But the changes to Street Fighter kept coming as the cast is completely different from the previous game. And so is, surprisingly enough, the story. In that now there actually was a story. Let's start by looking over this roster. You got Ryu and Ken, now set right after the first game, and Ryu is still wandering around the world looking to improve himself through battle, and Ken is looking to challenge Ryu. Yeah, one small detail about Street Fighter lore that I enjoy, the explanation for why Ken was not in the arcade ladder of Street Fighter 1 is that he just wasn't competing in that tournament. He was too busy with another tournament set in America, so now that both he and Ryu had been declared champs in their respective tournaments, he wanted to see who was tougher. Then you got Sagat, who isn't handling his defeat to Ryu that well. Probably because Ryu sure you can a giant scar into his chest and every time they seize it, it's a painful reminder of his loss. Then you got Chun-Li in a brand new outfit that I personally love, easily my favorite Chun-Li design. She just recently joined Interpol to try and track down her father's killer, the drug kingpin M. Bison. And she's not the only one looking for him. There's also Charlie Nash, a captain in the Air Force who's hunting down Bison to try and shut down his drug dealing criminal empire, Shadaloo. Side note, they keep referring to Shadaloo and Bison as drug dealers in this story, despite them never being referred to as such before or after this game. And I have to wonder if that's because at this time the FBI was launching a campaign to force anti-drug messages into video games and other forms of entertainment that were perceived as being aimed at kids. That's one of the reasons why in old arcade games you would always see the winners don't use drugs screen with a big FBI logo on it. In fact, that's not the only hidden government message you'll find in the original Alpha game. While I was editing this video, I found that very, very rarely when you activate a super, for one frame, a shot of a recycle message complete with the seal from the Environmental Protection Agency would flash up on the screen. I have no idea the story behind this, and if it weren't for the fact that I had to go through this footage frame by frame, I never would have seen it. What a weird little easter egg to find. But it does kind of back up my theory that Bison is only a drug dealer in this game because the United States government told Capcom, Okay, if you want to get your game released, we have a few messages you need to include. Drugs are bad, and if you have time, tell the kids to recycle or something. But back to Charlie, he is a new character in this game, but this isn't the first time that we've heard him mentioned. Remember how in the last game, Gal was chasing down M. Bison because he killed his commanding officer? Charlie Nash is that commanding officer. And Charlie wasn't just Gal's CO, he also taught him how to fight meaning Charlie uses several of Gal's attacks, and it's a small detail, but I love that when he fires out a sonic boom, he does it with only one hand. It gives up this feeling like, yeah, Gal learned how to do these attacks, but I'm the one who invented them. Let me show you how to do a real sonic boom. Then, as I said, the game was set between the events of Street Fighter 1 and 2, so they include some of the characters from the first game now playable for the first time. There's Adon, Sagat's top student, but in this game we learn he wasn't exactly a loyal student. Adon is kind of an a-hole, and he's basically the star scream of the Muay Thai world. He wants to overthrow Sagat and become the new top dog, and now that Sagat has been defeated by Ryu, he thinks he's weak and he's ready to strike. Then also returned from Street Fighter 1 is Birdie, and I know what you're thinking. Yes, Birdie did get a haircut from the first game. Looks good, I really dig that hole in his hawk, it's very punk. Okay, seriously though, yes, Capcom decided they would change Birdie's race from the first game, and the official explanation for why this happened is, and I kid you not, this is real, they say Birdie was sick in the first Street Fighter, so that's why he was so pale. Sure, it works for me, I have no follow-up questions. Birdie is a British punk who hears about Shadowloo, and he wants to join so he can get some respect. He's one of the two big grapplers of the game, meaning he's slow, but if he jumps on you and wraps those chains around you, you're going to feel it. But Street Fighter 1 isn't the only corner of this game's past that would re-emerge in Alpha. Remember in the last episode, I said Final Fight was originally going to be the sequel to the first Street Fighter, but after those plans were scrapped, Capcom decided that these two games would still exist within the same universe. 
The first hint of this was a cameo by Chun-Li in the background of Final Fight 2, but that was just an easter egg, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But now, in this game, we got Guy and Sodom from Final Fight officially in Street Fighter actually being playable characters and continuing their storylines from the first Final Fight. Guy is a very serious and stoic member of the Bushinryu clan, a group of ninjas who practice largely within cities, and you can see this urban ninja theme in his design thanks to his stylish sneakers that he never leaves home without. And he gets used to all those sneakers because Guy likes to run, and run a lot. He's a very fast and light character whose special largely revolve around running at the opponent and then turning that run into a different type of attack to try and mix the opponent up. Then Sodom was a high-ranking member of the Mad Gear Gang, the group of villains overrunning Metro City. After Final Fight, Mad Gear was disbanded and now Sodom is hoping to bring them back together again. He's another big bruiser and a bit of a grappler as well, and he's also a surprisingly popular character because Sodom… well I don't know the actual official term for this, but let's just say Sodom is an American guy who is a huge fan of Japanese culture, despite not accurately understanding most of it and not being able to properly speak the language. Something that Capcom has turned into a running gag for the character over the years, and fans love that about him. And that brings us to the last character in the roster, a brand new face in the game, Rose. Now, I'm going to need to break out those storytelling skills from our Blaze Blue episode, because who boy is there a ton of crazy lore behind Rose. Rose is a fortune teller from Spain with a very elaborate design, which was heavily inspired by Lisa Lisa from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. This is actually something of a trend for Street Fighter, as many other cores of this universe would take heavy inspiration from this legendary manga series. Many people point to Gao's haircut as being a reference to Paul Nareb, but Dalsim's stretchy limbs also came from Antonio Zeppeli's zoom punch technique. Now Rose possesses something known as soul power that she uses to see the future, levitate, send out energy blasts, all kinds of mystical abilities. Soul power, as you can probably guess, is the power of one's soul made manifest. Why is this important? Because soul power is basically the good version of psycho power, the power used by M. Bison. Now in Street Fighter Alpha, Rose is heading out to stop M. Bison because her fortune telling told her that Bison is about to bring about Doomsday. However, the relationship between Bison and Rose gets super murky after this point because most of it is explained in mangas and comics, and the Street Fighter mangas and comics are only canon when Capcom feels like it, and that can change depending on what day of the week it is. And just because one manga says one thing doesn't mean that another one can't come out at a later date and completely contradict it. But in one of the mangas, it states that M. Bison is the one who trained Rose to use soul power before he turned evil. So this mission to bring Bison down is kind of personal for her. However, in each of these games where Rose succeeds in defeating Bison, she always ends up passing out herself. And the game never really explains why that is, but according to the Street Fighter Extended Universe, that's because Bison, in his quest to grow stronger, needed to get rid of the good that was within his soul. So he ripped that good part of his soul out and then put it in Rose. So if Bison dies, then so does Rose. Now you might hear that and think, wow, that's a lot of background for these characters. And you're right, which is one of the defining elements of the Alpha series. This was the game where Capcom said, hey, maybe we should actually start developing a story in these games. Which, if I had to guess, is probably another influence from the movie. I said that the movie isn't the reason this game got made, but the developers at Capcom did watch it, and Noritaka Funamizu even said that he felt motivated by it. That film took a lot of the basic elements of Street Fighter 2 and tried to figure out a way to make it all fit together. So this game made sure to start building up the story of this world, covering how these characters came together, and it has a similar tone to what we saw in that anime. And part of how they gave this game so much story is there isn't a single final boss. No, there's no tournament in this game, so it wouldn't make sense for every character to need to go and fight the same one person. So each character has a final boss that is sued specifically just for them. Ken and Sagat fight Ryu, Ryu and Adon fight Sagat, Sodom fights Guy, and then the remaining five characters all fight M. Bison, who is in this game as an unplayable boss. Unplayable unless you know the secret code to unlock him. Yes folks, this game had a three month long planned development, a truly hellish deadline meaning there was no time to put in here any kind of bonus content. And yet the dev team did anyways, because there are three unlockable characters in this game. There's Bison and two characters who can also act as secret boss fights. First up is the returning Akuma. As I mentioned last time, he was the brother of Ken and Ryu's master, who became obsessed with getting stronger until he was overtaken by a dark force known as the Satsui no Hado. 
He then killed his brother and master and now travels the world looking only to fight strong opponents to the death. Now, I know this makes him sound like the most edgelord to ever edgelord, and a lot of people think that Akuma is just a really simple, basic, dark, evil version of Ryu, but there's actually more to Akuma than you might think, and the Alpha games did a lot to flesh that out. Over the course of these games, we would see that Akuma only kills those who he deems worthy, and he won't fight anyone who doesn't want to fight back, and he despises M. Bison because he seeks strength by taking it from others rather than by earning it himself. For a guy so obsessed with murder, he's actually got his own unique set of morals that he sticks to. Now, on the home release of Alpha, you can fight Akuma in a similar way to the last game, make it to the end of the game without losing a match, and finishing each round with a super. But in the arcade release, they took such a bizarre approach. To fight him in the arcade, all you have to do is just hover over the character you want to play, hold down start, and then select that character by pressing medium kick and medium punch. Then you skip the entire arcade ladder and just go directly into fighting Akuma. And considering he's about as strong as he was in Super Turbo, unless you were an absolute pro at Alpha, you basically just paid a quarter so you could instantly lose. Yeah, seriously, I can't tell if this version of Akuma is harder than the one in Super Turbo, and remember, Super Turbo was bugged to always be at max difficulty. It's also worth pointing out that Akuma gets a brand new ability in this game, although it was foreseen in Street Fighter 2. If you have all three bars of your super meter filled, then you can press light punch, light punch, forward, light kick, heavy punch, and then you can pull off the Raging Demon. This is the move that he used to take out M. Bison in the last game, but now it's just an ability that he can pull out in actual combat. He slides across the screen, grabs you, then the screen goes black and he pummels you to death. And just like the Hadouken and the Shoryuken, I would argue that the Raging Demon has gone on to be one of the most popular and famous moves in not just Street Fighter, but in fighting games in general. But if we got Akuma over here just sucking up all the badassness in his secret spot, then who's left? Why, the guy who had all his badassness sucked out of him to make room for Akuma, that's who. Yes, the final secret spot belongs to the most polar opposite inclusion you could possibly make for Akuma, Dan Hibiki. Dan Hibiki has gone on to be one of the biggest, most popular faces for Street Fighter. Because he's good? No, for the exact opposite reason. Dan Hibiki is a joke character who uses Psycho style, his own brand of martial arts that's a bad inferior version of the Shotokan style practiced by Ryu and Ken. But why would Capcom make a character like that? Simple, out of spite. Yes, during the fighting game boom of the 90s, Capcom's competitor SNK would put out a flood of their own fighting games, and one of their biggest titles was Art of Fighting, which was also created by Takashi Nishiyama, the creator of the first Street Fighter game. Art of Fighting starred a martial artist named Ryo, who wore a gi and could shoot fireballs out of his hands, and he could do a rising punch attack and a kick that sent him flying forward, and he had a close friend who trained with him and could also do similar attacks. And Capcom looked at that and said, Hey, what the hell do you think you're doing? Well, okay, it wasn't that aggressive. As I said, Street Fighter's creator went on to make Art of Fighting, and SNK and Capcom back in those days were constantly training employees back and forth like baseball cards. So this rivalry between the two companies was pretty good-natured. Each of them were just taking playful jabs at each other, and that's what Dan was. It was meant to be a parody of the characters from Art of Fighting. He throws out a fireball just like Ryo, using only one hand, except his is much smaller. He wears a gi just like Ryo, except that his is pink. His hair looks exactly like Robert Garcia. And later on in this series, he would even get a wind pose that was just a straight-up parody of what Ryo's sister Yuri's wind pose was. And as I said, since premiering here, Dan would go on to be incredibly popular. In fact, I'd argue he's quite possibly the most popular joke character in any fighting game. But I'll talk more about Dan when we get to the next game, because... Well, I'll be honest with you, I don't have a ton of footage of Dan in this game, because I was able to fight him in the arcade ladder just fine. To fight Dan, you have to make sure that your character says the exact same win quote for the first five matches, which you can do by holding down the start button and pressing a direction as soon as you win with each direction to sign which win quote you say, so just make sure you press the exact same direction every single time. However, did I mention that Dan wasn't very good? Yeah, every time that I fought him, he just stood there the entire time and let me wail on him. It's not exactly the best footage to show what he's about. Then again, he's a joke character, so maybe it is. 
However, you can select Dan, as well as Akuma and Bison, and play through the arcade ladder with them. But while facing Dan is fairly easy, unlocking Dan to play as is next to impossible. To unlock M. Bison, you have to hover over the random select button, hold start, and then press down, down, left, left, down, left, left, and then light punch and heavy punch. To unlock Akuma, go to random select, hold start, and press down, 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 left, 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 and then light and heavy punch. Okay, none of those sound too bad. That's pretty easy to do. But to unlock Dan, you have to hover over random select, hold start, and then hit light punch, light kick, medium kick, heavy kick, heavy punch, and medium punch. Not at the same time though. No, you have to input the commands of all six of those buttons individually in that order before the machine can register the input of the first button. On an arcade board, that's not too difficult because it's designed for you to just make one big giant counterclockwise circle with your fingers starting at light punch and then looping around. But on a controller, that is next to impossible. You need five friends each holding their own button and having perfect timing to pull that off. So yeah, as I said, we'll talk more about Dan in the next game. Although while we're talking about unlockables, there is one more secret that they managed to cram in here during their incredibly stressful development. As I've been saying all this time, Street Fighter Alpha wasn't made because of the anime movie, but it did get hints of inspiration here and there. However, there is one part of this game that was indeed taken directly from the film. Noritaka Funamizu went to see the film and he was blown away by the ending fight scene where Ryu and Ken have to team up together to take on Bison, two versus one. So Funamizu went to the game's lead programmer Okada and said, we need to find a way to put that into the game. A way for two players to take on one supercharged Bison together. And Okada said, there is no way we're going to do that. But if you can somehow get me the rights to use the same music that they used in that movie when they fought him, then I'll do it. And so somehow, Funamizu managed to do exactly that. He got the rights to use the exact same song from the anime when they were fighting Bison for this special mode. So Okada had to make good on his promise. And thus, dramatic battle mode was born. To activate this mode, there had to be two players. Player 1 had to highlight Ryu, and player 2 had to highlight Ken. Then both players had to hold start and press up up. Then release start, press up up again, and player 1 had to hit light punch, and player 2 had to hit heavy punch. And then you could relive the final battle of the film with Ryu and Ken facing off with Bison. But okay, I believe that is everything to cover in this game. A shockingly large amount of content for one of the most rushed video games in Capcom's history. So let's move into those arcade endings. Ryu defeats Sagat and continues his search for his own answers through battle. While in Sagat's ending, he defeats Ryu, but he knows that Ryu let him win because he pitied him making Sagat even angrier, only for M. Bison to arrive and say, hey, if you really want to get stronger, let me tell you all about Psycho Power. Ken ends up meeting Eliza, the woman who he married in Street Fighter 2, and hey, fun fact, Eliza is actually the sister of Guile. Yeah, that's real. Ken ends up becoming Guile's brother-in-law. That's one of the great things about these games. As the story goes on, each of these characters start to come together and form bonds with each other that would remain constant throughout the series. Sodom tries to restart the Mad Gear gang, Guy tries to kick Shadow's bad influence out of Metro City, Birdie actually joins Shadow and then uses his influence to start pushing people around, Bison tries to recruit Adon and he refuses because he thinks that he's too good for Shadow, Charlie actually defeats Bison but then it turns out that one of his fellow pilots is actually working for Shadow and he betrays him, giving Bison the chance to kill him. Chun-Li is unable to capture Bison, but finds out that he's about to start a tournament in Thailand, so she heads there, leading directly into the events of Street Fighter 2. And Rose ends up killing Bison, but destroys herself in the process. Now, not all of these endings are canon, mostly the Rose one because she did not end up dying in this game, but most of them were, which was actually kind of rare for fighting games back then. At this time, whoever you picked in a fighting game would go up against and defeat the boss, but you can't have everybody fight the same one guy and everyone then becomes the champion of a tournament. 
No, most fighting games typically only have one ending that's actually canonical. But here, yeah, Ryu fought Sagat again, and Sagat joined Shadowloo, and Ken met Eliza, and Chun-Li found out about the tournament, and Charlie was betrayed by his own men and killed before he could finish Bison off. Pretty much all of these endings actually happen, meaning this story started to build up a lore for Street Fighter. It started to establish how the story played out and what characters' connections were to each other, thereby giving these characters and this world so much more depth than the previous game. Listen, if there's one thing that I have learned about fighting games over the years, it's that there is a sizable chunk of the audience out there that loves fighting games just for the characters and for the weird, wacky world that these stories all take place in. And if you're one of those fans, this is when Street Fighter started to aim itself at you. But was this bold new direction a success? I mean, after all, Street Fighter 2 is a tough act to follow, and everyone was looking forward to Street Fighter 3. And this wasn't Street Fighter 3 while also being the third Street Fighter game, so yeah, emotions were high in all different directions. Well, Street Fighter Alpha wouldn't do as well as Street Fighter 2, but that's like saying a lighthouse wasn't as bright as the sun. Nothing was going to do as well as Street Fighter 2, it was the third biggest arcade release of all time. But it did go on to be the second most successful arcade game in Japan in 1995, with number one being Virtua Fighter 2, and considering that Virtua Fighter 2 is a religion in Japan, second place isn't that bad. Which means that Capcom was prepared to support this game, just like how they support Street Fighter 2. Meaning it was time to start pumping out sequels. Sequels that would be so big, they would end up completely overshadowing the original release. Street Fighter Alpha 2 would be released the next year in 1996 and would see several tweaks to the gameplay that make this feel less like an update and almost like a completely different game. The combat is still fast and fluid, you can still air block, and you can still do alpha counters, although it's worth pointing out that in most fighting games that use alpha counters, the alpha counter doesn't actually do any damage to the opponent. The point of the alpha counter is to get the opponent off of you, not to actually be an attack. But in Street Fighter Alpha 2, the alpha counters do insane damage, and they can and will kill you. Over the years, I've played a lot of fighting games with alpha counters in them, and yet to this day, I have yet to find one where you will die to alpha counters as often as you will in Alpha 2. The computer loves to read your input, block, and then kill you with an alpha counter. However, the chain combos are now gone, although you can still combo together normals pretty easily thanks to how smooth the combat is, and I can't quite put my finger on it, but it feels so much easier to air juggle your opponent now. But the big change is that in addition to using your meter for supers now, you can also spin the meter by pressing two punches and a kick, or two kicks and a punch, to initiate the game's newest mechanic, the custom combo. In this mode, almost every single move, whether it be a normal or a special, can now combo together for a limited period of time. It does take practice to pull it off, it feels different for every single character, as some characters can just spam one button while other characters have to swap between attacks, and you have to press these buttons incredibly fast to keep up with this new boost of speed. But the worst part is that when you activate it, you run forward, which is actually really good because it can surprise your opponent by quickly closing in on them, but you can't change your direction after you start it. So if the opponent jumps over you, then you are now running headfirst into a wall with your back wide open until this ability runs out. But even with that downside, it feels insanely fun to pull off. It does use up all of your meter though, and unless you know exactly what you're doing, you could probably do more damage with that meter just using it for supers, and if you can't tell from the footage you're watching, I do not know exactly what I'm doing. However, even saying that, I still constantly went for the custom combo because I can't lie, doing crazy stuff like this 
It's just fun. It's very fun. Fighting games are great when they make you feel like you're doing crazy cool stuff. And custom combos make you feel like you're doing crazy cool stuff. By the way, I fully realize that I'm not summing this up in the most eloquent way possible with the most in-depth detailed analysis, but in my defense, I don't really need to sound smart when I can do stuff like this. That custom combo was in no way optimal, and I could have done immensely more damage if I had the slightest clue of what I was doing, but god did it look cool and it just felt so fun. And this combat, while being nuts and many people arguing it's a bit busted, has been largely applied by everyone else. Listen, I'm going to jump around the timeline here a bit, but when you look at tournaments for Street Fighter games, most people will run tournaments for the last version of the game. Street Fighter 2, vast majority of tournaments you're going to find are for Super Turbo. Street Fighter 3, nobody plays anything other than the final version of that game. Street Fighter 4, Street Fighter 5, same thing. Whatever was the last version in that series is the version that everyone plays. But when it comes to the Alpha series, Listen, Alpha 3 still sees occasional tournament play here and there. Lots of people really enjoy Alpha 3, but the majority of professional Alpha tournaments are for Alpha 2. Even though it has fewer characters than Alpha 3, Alpha 2 is constantly considered to have some of the craziest gameplay in the entire series, and people love it for that. But people also love this game's presentation. The anime look at the previous game remains, although it feels like certain characters are even more exaggerated to match Bingus' style, but hey, I'm okay with that. Alpha 2 was the height of Bingus mania. And it is a very small detail, but when talking about this game's presentation, I absolutely love that when a character finishes someone off with a custom combo, rather than getting some generic U1 icon up there, every single character gets their own unique symbol. It is a small thing, and it is only there for flavor, but you know what? Mmm, that's some good flavor. I would gladly take this in way more fighting games. But the biggest bump in visual quality has to be the stages. They were fine in the last game, but now they are stunning. Arguably some of the best stages in this entire franchise. Guy's stage features a cavalcade of other Final Fight characters. The Waterfall stage is jaw-dropping. The Field of Fate stage is a great callback to the Sagat fight in the Street Fighter movie. Charlie's stage has a freaking jet just hovering there the entire time. And Ken's stage? Good lord, this stage? Good lord, this stage. As a Capcom fanboy, this stage became my favorite thing in a fighting game for years. It's a birthday party that Ken is throwing on his yacht for his girlfriend Eliza, and everyone there is a reference to another Capcom game. You have the unknown fighters from Forgotten Warriors, you got Michelle Hart from Legendary Wings, Pierre the Mage from Adventure Quiz, Ninja Commando and Captain Commando from, you guessed it, Captain Commando, Strider Hiryu is there holding a teddy bear for Eliza, which he tosses into the air whenever a character gets knocked down, Victor Ortega and Biff Slamkovich from Saturday Night Slam Masters, Lynn Kurosawa from the Alien vs. Predator beat-em-up game, who, by the way, Capcom doesn't even 100% officially own, which makes this cameo even crazier, and Felicia, Morgan, and humanoid versions of Lord Raptor and Hesinko and her sister from Darkstalkers. This stage is an amazing love letter to the history of Capcom's arcade games. But enough reminiscing about the past, let's see the new additions that were added to this game's roster. Everyone from the previous game returned, including the three unlockable characters, meaning Akuma now finally got a story in this game, which largely revolves around him trying to tempt Ryu with the Satsui no Hado, setting up an ongoing relationship between these two that is perfectly captured on this game's cover, which is easily one of the top five most iconic fighting game images of the 90s. I love Alpha 1 and I love Alpha 3, but I cannot remember the box art for those games to save my life because the moment I think of the Alpha series, this image is all I see. And Dan Hibiki is playable, meaning I can finally talk more about his playstyle. As I mentioned, he has moves that are similar to Ryu and Ken, but far weaker and slower and a lot of his moves don't actually connect or combo together. Which, back in the day, I was so bad at comboing and fighting games, I didn't even realize that part was a thing but his specialty lies in his taunts. He has multiple moves that allow him to roll around and thrust his fist out to taunt the opponent. And what did these taunts accomplish? Nothing, they are just there to show off what a big blowhard Dan is. They have no purpose in the game at all other than just flavor. Yeah, Dan Hibiki was created to be fun, not competitively viable. 
However, many people in the Street Fighter community actually consider it to be good manners to show Dan respect when he taunts, and if they see the opponent doing it, they just stand there and let him finish. However, as silly as all this sounds, Dan actually does have something of a sad backstory. He's in this game trying to hunt down Sagat because Sagat killed his father after Dan's dad took out Sagat's eye. Yeah, apparently Dan's old man was something of a badass back in the day, and he's the one who's responsible for Sagat's eye patch. Now as for the new characters, Dalsim and Zangief from Street Fighter 2 return, with Dalsim being targeted by Shadaloo for his powers, and Zangief traveling to America to challenge Ken Masters to show the superiority of Russian muscle. Yeah, since the last game, a lot of things changed in the real world, so Zangief is now no longer from the USSR, but instead from Russia. And he is 100% obsessed with the idea of bringing pride to the motherland. One thing Street Fighter has been known and in some cases criticized for over the years is having rosters full of super stereotypes. And Zangief's ending in this game feels like Capcom was just going down the checklist of Russian jokes. Gorbachev sends Zangief out into the frozen tundra with a case of vodka to wrestle bears because he believes it will somehow restore the motherland to glory. My apologies for that awful, awful attempt at a Russian accent. After this game, Capcom would significantly tone down Geef's Russian pride, but it was at its peak in this game. But as for the new additions, we got another brand new Final Fight character, Rolinto. He was another villain from the franchise, and he's a super militant general who is obsessed with forming his own army to take over Metro City. He fights with lots of flips and jumps, making him one of the more agile characters in this game. Then there's another returning character from the original Street Fighter, Gin. He's an ancient assassin who is obsessed with death, and despite being nearly a hundred years old, he still keeps fighting because he refuses to die outside of battle. He also trained Chun-Li's father, who then ended up training Chun-Li, although some versions of the story say he also trained Chun-Li as well. Again, Street Fighter lore smudges the details here and there. He's a stance fighter who's capable of switching between two completely different fighting styles with totally unique attacks in each of them, and I think this might actually be the earliest example of a stance character in a fighting game. I can't think of an earlier example. If you can, let me know in the comments down below. But the final new character added to the roster is the biggest contribution the Alpha series made to the cast of Street Fighter, Sakura Kusagano. She's a fighting super fan who wants to be a Street Fighter just like her heroes, and one day she sees Ryu, probably after the tournament in the first game where he beats Sagat, and decides she's going to learn to fight just like him. So she tries to teach herself by copying his moves, and she actually gets pretty good at it. She even taught herself how to fire out a Hadouken. But she's still following Ryu all across the world so she can ask him to be her teacher. Sakura blew up after this game. She went on to be one of the biggest faces for the franchise and a massive fan favorite character. People love her upbeat personality, her positivity and enthusiasm. She's probably the first character in Street Fighter whose win quotes actually sound like she's genuinely happy that she got to fight. She's even got some sick dance moves. What isn't there to love about this character? And from there, she would spread out to so many other corners of Capcom appearing in games like Rival Schools a few years later, then the Marvel vs. Capcom series, and so many other titles. In fact, in 2018, to celebrate the release of Street Fighter V Arcade Edition, Capcom held a poll to find the most popular character in this series, and Sakura came in number one. So yeah, saying she's a big face for this series and a fan favorite is an understatement. People love Sakura. Now once again, each character has a boss fight that's unique to them, with special pre-fight dialogue that goes into their stories. But for Alpha 2, Capcom went one step further and introduced the rival battles. These were secret mid-boss fights that would be unlocked right before the boss. If you had won at least five rounds using a super combo finisher, then right before you go into your next fight, it would be interrupted as a new challenger would appear, and you would get another unique fight with another character that would contain special pre-fight dialogue. This is brilliant and way. Way more fighting games need to do stuff like this. I have said it before and I'll say it till I'm blue in the face, there are many reasons to love fighting games, but a lot of people love them for the characters. They love their designs, their big personalities, their histories, and their connections with the other characters. But you don't always need a big massive story mode to explore all that. 
Sometimes just giving unique pre-fight dialogue between characters gets the job done. And if that unique dialogue will only appear from a fight that you have to unlock in the arcade ladder, then it feels special and rewarding and provides your arcade ladder with replay value. But in addition to this, there was also one more bonus fight. Akuma would once again be a special unlockable boss fight, except that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense since Akuma is also a regular playable character, so how is he also a secret super hard boss? Well, that's because this game introduced a brand new version of Akuma, Shin Akuma. This is a version of Akuma who has been overtaken by the Satsui no Hado, ascending to a new level of power. To unlock this fight, you have to make it all the way to the boss, not losing a single round, and you need at least three perfects. Which sounds tough, but Alpha 2 isn't the hardest game in the series, so it's not all that difficult. Beating Shin Akuma though? Yeah, that's a different case. At this point, you shouldn't be shocked to learn the secret Akuma fight in a Street Fighter game is always going to be horrendously unfair. Now, Shin Akuma wasn't playable, although it was revealed just a few years ago that on the Super Nintendo version of the game, there is data of a playable Shin Akuma, and through some crazy method, you can actually play as him. But there was one unlockable character who was on every version of this game, Evil Ryu. I mentioned in the last episode that Ryu left a scar on Sagat's chest when they fought because something dark inside of Ryu overwhelmed him during the fight and he lost control. Well, it turns out Akuma isn't the only one to be touched by the Satsui no Hado. Ryu also has that same evil inside of him, and Ryu's struggle to fight against this darkness would be one of the driving plotlines of his character throughout this series. So as you can imagine, evil Ryu is Ryu being overcome by the Satsui no Hado and becoming so obsessed with combat that it turns deadly. And as for how evil Ryu fights, it's just Akuma. It's literally just Ryu using all of Akuma's moveset, including the iconic Raging Demon. Now, when it comes to the character endings, this is kind of a weird situation, because for some characters, this is a sequel to their endings in the last game. And for other characters, this is just a retelling of the events of the last game. I mean, Charlie died in Alpha 1. It's not like he came back for this game as a zombie. That won't happen until Street Fighter V. But some of the points of interest include Sakura Mean Ryu, and even though he rejects her request to teach her, they still get a foe together and she holds onto it. Ken helps Ryu, who's struggling with the Satsui no Hado inside of him, and he gives Ryu his iconic red headband to help guide him whenever he's in doubt. Gen fights Akuma, looking for someone strong enough to kill him, and this would actually kick off a long-running rivalry between these two characters. M. Bison captures Ryu and tries to fill him with psycho power, and even though this ending isn't canon, it is our first hint that M. Bison's true goal with all these warriors gathering together is to find someone that he can put the psycho power into, so that way he can take over their body. Dan Hibiki defeats Sagat and opens up his own dojo, although it was later revealed that Sagat let Dan win because he felt bad about killing his father. And Ryu faces off with Akuma, who ends up destroying an entire freaking island as they're standing on it, telling Ryu that he'll face him again when he succumbed to the Satsui no Hado and realizes his true potential. Sort of setting up Akuma to almost be like a Darth Vader figure for Ryu. And I'm not just saying that because the anime implies that Akuma might be his dad. Although, yeah, that's also a thing. And so, Street Fighter Alpha 2 comes to a close, and as I said, the gameplay of this new installment is still beloved to this day. The presentation was leagues above anything we had seen from Capcom at this time, and characters were introduced who would become breakout stars for this series. It is incredible that Capcom's dev team was able to get the first Alpha game out working at all considering how little time they had to make it, but Alpha 2 shows how much they were able to improve upon that with just a little extra time. But that raises the question, if Alpha 2 improved things this much from the first game, how much were things going to change when they move into the third installment? Street Fighter Alpha 3 would be released in June of 1998, meaning we went from a game with only a three-month development schedule, to a follow-up with only a few more months of development, to a third installment with over two years of build-up. 
Although it is worth pointing out, it's not like they spent those two years solely tinkering away on this game. No, these developers were also involved in several other projects happening at Capcom, a big one we will talk about in the next episode, but they also released an updated version of Street Fighter Alpha 2 called Alpha 2 Gold. This was a home port of the game that includes some balance changes and bonus content, such as a powerful EX version of several characters, adding Cammy to the roster, and introducing a bonus way of playing where any of the characters that were in Street Fighter 2 could now play more like they did in that game. They wouldn't have any super moves, but they would do more damage. And in many ways, Gold would serve as an inspiration for the next installment, because this idea of giving characters more than one way of playing would become what Alpha 3 was all about. This game would introduce what would become known as the ISM system. This meant after picking your character, you would be given the opportunity to pick how you wanted to play. You could choose the A-ism, or Z-ism in Japan, name that because it's basically the classic alpha playstyle, so the A stands for alpha and the Z stands for zero. It brings back all the gameplay elements of the last game, although it does do away with the custom combos, so your meter is only used for supers now. Then there was the X-ism which allowed you to play like Street Fighter 2 with only one bar for supers, no air blocking, no alpha counters, but you did do increased damage. Although, I personally don't think the trade-off is worth it, so yeah, I rarely ever touch this ism. And in case you're wondering why it's called the X-ism, it's because in Japan, Street Fighter 2 Super Turbo was called Street Fighter X. And lastly, there's the V-ism, a totally new way of playing that shares a lot in common with the A-ism, except you do slightly less damage, and also you don't have super moves. Instead, what you use your super meter for is to enter a hyper state that's sort of a twist on the custom combo. For a limited time, you have a shadow of yourself that mimics all of your attacks, allowing you to apply some extra pressure to your opponent, and if you're really good with this mode, you can basically break the entire game as each character can pull off an infinite if you start juggling the opponent in the corner. I, however, am not super good with this mode, so I tend to stick with the A-ism. But when you do get that custom combo hitting just right, it does feel pretty good. This is another reason why I think a lot of tournaments tend to run Alpha 2 over 3, because I'll admit, I do think Alpha 2 feels smoother, so just based on that, I do enjoy playing Alpha 2 more. But a lot of pros don't play Alpha 3, simply because of how much you can break it with the V-ism. But that being said, I do think each of these still feel fun to play, and I love the customization that goes into this. I love that three people can pick the exact same character and play each of them completely different. One of the biggest appeals of fighting games to me is expression. It's the idea of being able to play a game and a character in a way that speaks to you. And I think the ism system is a great idea for that. So they essentially created three totally unique balance systems for this game. That is an insane amount of work. You can tell that the two years that they spent between games allowed them to expand upon what they had already built so much. And that goes beyond just the gameplay, because the roster of this game is massive! Once again, every character returns from the previous game, but now from Street Fighter 2, you also got Vega, E Honda, and Blanca, who, because this game is set before Street Fighter 2, is at his most savage, talking mostly in ape noises. Then Kami is here in a totally new outfit. At least, totally new for Street Fighter. This design for Kami originally appeared in the crossover game X-Men vs. Street Fighter, which kind of speaks to how hectic everything at Capcom was right now. People would be working on games, but they had to get other games out at the exact same time, often using employees who were working on other games, being pulled in to work on a brand new game. So yeah, sometimes you would get Cammy popping up in a crossover game in an outfit that was reserved for a later game, but that later game was still being worked on, but that crossover game had to come out now. I feel like the moral of almost every single one of our retrospective videos is just, making video games in the 90s was a nightmare. By the way, while I'm on this topic, just to get out of the way now, I know that X-Men vs. Street Fighter and Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter have Street Fighter in their name, but I consider them to be part of the Marvel vs. series, not part of the Street Fighter series. So we'll save them for when we eventually do a retrospective on those games. But this design for Cammy would become rather iconic, and it would give us a look at her history as this was the costume that she wore when she was a brainwashed soldier for Bison, going by the codename Killer B. This game went way deeper into Kami's backstory as we learned that Bison had a whole group of specially trained young women serving under him who he referred to as his dolls. Bison's kind of a creep if you couldn't tell, and I am so glad that they dropped that plot line from the last game of him and Kami being in love, because that would have somehow made this a thousand times creepier than it already is. Then from Final Fight we have one of the two other playable characters, Cody. 
Although, Cody ain't doing as hot as Guy. Guy is mostly the same, but Cody? Well, Cody spent Final Fight walking around the city beating up every member of the Mad Gear gang he could find to try and save his girlfriend Jessica. But when the Mad Gear gang was gone, Cody wasn't done beating people up. After the events of Final Fight, Cody kept walking around the city beating up every member of the Mad Gear gang he could find. And people that looked like members of the Mad Gear gang. And people that just looked at him in the wrong way when he was in a bad mood. And I don't know if you guys know this, but even within the Street Fighter universe, you can't just go around beating up random people. That tends to get you in trouble with the law. So Cody ended up going to jail, and this caused him to have a massive change in personality. He was now no longer an action hero roaming around the city trying to save whoever he could. Instead, he viewed being sent to prison as punishment for him trying to help the people of Metro City, so now he doesn't care anymore. He doesn't really think there's any point to trying to help people. This is a pretty massive heel turn for one of Capcom's earliest heroes. By the way, if you're wondering when all this happened, it actually, and I am not kidding you, occurred within the Final Fight specific fighting game, Final Fight Revenge, which was only released in Japan and came out the year after this game. And now that I've mentioned Final Fight Revenge, I am required by law to show you the Mike Hagar Super. But then one day, Cody just got bored of being in jail, so he decided to break out by punching down the wall. Yeah, what's that old expression about when all you have is a hammer? Cody fights with punches, sliding kicks, and tornado winds, but he can also pick up rocks to throw at the opponent and a knife to fight with. Although every time that I pick up that knife, Cody always stops for a second to mug to the camera, which leaves him wide open, so yeah, I tend to just stick with my fist. Then lastly, there's two brand new characters. Armika is a Japanese wrestler who is a huge fan of Zangief and wants to be his student and become a big superstar. People love Armika. She's got a massive interject bombastic personality, and her throws have some of the best animation in the game. She actually brings out an entire wrestling ring when she does her super. It's great. Also, I love that her trainer rides out on a scooter during her victory animation. Little touches like that show so much thought put into these characters. And the final new character was kind of a guest character. This is Karin Kanzuki, and I say that she was kind of a guest character because at the time, Capcom didn't officially own her. She was created for a manga that came out in 1996 called Street Fighter Sakura Ganbaru, which roughly translates to Sakura Do Your Best. Yeah, remember how I said Sakura blew up? Capcom knew how popular she was, so they quickly got manga made all about her. And in that manga, Karin acted as Sakura's rival. She's a rich studi heiress who believes that her family's fighting style is the greatest, but after Sakura defeats her, she becomes obsessed with chasing Sakura down and gaining her revenge. And because this is where Karin originated, any time that she appeared in a game, Capcom would always have to give credit to the mangaka behind the series where she came from. So okay, that brings this roster up to a whopping 25 characters, the largest this series has ever seen. And with the ism system, there was now so much variety to the combat, so this game was bursting with content, and the presentation was amazing, especially the sound design, the electric zooming or charging sound effect, whatever you want to call it, this thing. Showtime! Yeah, whatever that is, whenever that plays before a match, it always got me pumped. And the announcer? This is easily one of the top five best fighting game announcers of all time. Greg Irwin provided narration for this game, and this man is a walking hype machine. But when it comes to the bump in presentation, nowhere is that more true than in the story. Because remember how in the last two games you got unique dialogue with unique bosses, meaning each character got their own little bit of story to them? Well, in this game, unfortunately, there's no unique boss fight. Instead, everyone is just racing to stop M. Bison, who's charging up a weapon called the Psycho Drive, which is going to drain the energy of the strongest fighters alive to let Bison take over the world. Or allow him to use his Psycho Power to take over their bodies. It kind of varies from character to character. But either way, this Psycho Drive is powering up Bison, turning him into the most final boss version of Bison we have ever seen. Even the sky on his stage is trying to tell you, you are going to die. He hits harder, he's faster, and his big super move nukes the entire screen. If you are not blocking, your life bar is gone. 
Another reason why I don't like using the Exism is because you can't air block with it. So the moment that you jump against Bison while using the Exism, the computer is going to read the hell out of that input and destroy you for it. It was at this moment that he knew. He f***ed up. But to make matters worse, the most brutal thing about this final boss, if you lose to M. Bison, game over. No, I'm not kidding. It is game over. You only get one shot to beat M. Bison, and then not only do you lose, but you have to sit there and watch M. Bison's ending where he uses your character to charge up the Psycho Drive to let him take over the world. Now, listen, I know how the sausage is made. I get it. I understand that developers at this time try to make arcade games difficult so that way you'll keep pumping quarters into it. But you know what inspires me to keep putting money into an arcade machine and try again? Knowing I'm so close to winning that if I try again, then maybe, just maybe, I can do it this time. You know what doesn't inspire me to put money into a machine and try again? Getting kicked out from the final boss and told I have to go all the way back to the very beginning like this is a freaking Ghost and Goblins game. Yeah, no thank you, I'm good. I'm going to go back to playing Tekken 3 now. However, while the game might now have only had one final boss, it took these special story-related fights from the previous games and expanded upon that. Now, when you get halfway through the arcade ladder, each character has a unique fight with unique dialogue. Then, when you're one match away from facing the boss, you get another unique fight with even more unique dialogue. And then you get unique dialogue with Bison. In fact, there's even a handful of characters in this game who when they go up against Bison, instead Bison just goes, I don't have time for this. And then surprise, there's now an extra fight in the arcade ladder. Then he'll step aside and you'll have to fight either Balrog or two brand new characters, Julie and Junie. These are two more of Bison's dolls, and while Junie doesn't have a whole lot of story behind her, Julie actually has connections to other characters within this franchise, and we'll get to that later. And if you fight Julie and Junie, you have to fight both of them at the exact same time. Yeah, remember the dramatic battles from the first game when you played as Ryu and Ken fighting Bison? Well, dramatic battles also return for Alpha 2 and Alpha 3, but now you can pick whichever character you want. But in Alpha 3, you now got to see what it was like to be outnumbered as you face down Julie and Junie. And here's the really wild part. Julie, Junie, and Balrog are all selectable in the game as hidden characters, but they don't have any story to them. If you play through the arcade ladder with any of these three characters, it's just in Bison's story. So I can only assume the only reason that they're hidden characters is because they just didn't have time to give them unique stories. But they're still fully programmed and playable characters, meaning this game actually has a roster of 28 characters. But as I was saying, every character has unique story-related fights and dialogue halfway through the arcade ladder, then again at the penultimate fight, and once again right before the M. Bison fight. And they each have their own very lengthy endings with tons of original art made just for these cutscenes. Seriously, I have to talk about how good these arcade endings are because they went hard for the late 90s. First time I beat the game with Ryu and I saw him about to be overtaken by Bison's psycho power, but then he got flashes of all of his friends and rivals telling him to keep fighting until he's able to overcome this power and blow Bison away, my jaw dropped. We did not get stuff like this in fighting games back then. Hell, a lot of fighting games still don't give us stuff like this. It is insane how much story they put into these arcade ladders. At this time, there were other fighting games out there with big stories to them, like King of Fighters or Mortal Kombat, but a lot of the story in those games happened outside of the games themselves. It was in lore that was built up around the games. They weren't really in the games themselves. You would get a little bit of story in each character's endings and maybe some unique dialogue before the boss fight. This was leaps and bounds ahead of what everyone else was doing in their arcade ladders, and to this day, I still say this is what arcade ladders should be several random fights to give them variety, then multiple story-related fights with special dialogue to give you more of an idea of who these characters are. Those little bits of story make you curious about the other characters. It makes you actually want to try Arcade Ladder with characters that aren't just your mains. You want to see where everyone's story is going to go. Although there is one rather big thing to point out about these stories. In the previous games, each character's ending was canon. Mostly. Some of the villain endings are a bit up there for debate but everyone else had actual endings. But here, yeah, everyone is just racing to stop M. Bison, so the cannon is kind of thrown out the window. Dan Hibiki does not defeat M. Bison and save the world. 
Heck, in Alpha 1 and Alpha 2, Charlie dies in his ending because that's what happened. In Alpha 3, he lives and defeats him Bison because why not? None of this is real, it's just here for fun. However, even if these endings aren't canon, so much about these exchanges and the character-specific fights would go on to influence the story of the future games. Karin tells Armiga that she's impressed by her wrestling and she wants to sponsor her. Cut to Street Fighter V, where Armiga works for Karin. Zangief meets E-Honda and the two of them become friends, and yes, in the later games, Zangief and E-Honda are actually friends. Ryu fights Ken, who's now being controlled by Bison's psycho power, and that's not just another reference to the movie, it's also something that comes up in the story of these games later on. In Blanca's story, he meets up with Dan and Beaky, who claims that Blanca saved his life when they were younger, and when Blanca asks for help taking down Bison, Dan gets Sakura because she just happened to be passing by at the time, and to this day, Dan, Sakura, and Blanca are all close friends who continue to work together in each game. And in Kami's story, we learn that Vega was the one who gave her the scar on her face, but more importantly, we learn her true origin. You know, after they rewrote the whole love angle thing from the last game that we should never ever bring back up again. She was actually a genetic experiment created by Shadowloo and is a clone of M. Bison. Yeah, kind of a big twist from the last game, and while they would continue to twist and change Cammy's origin a bit in future games, working her team Delta Red back into her origin, for the most part, this story would remain her canon background. Oh, also, uh, one real quick correction. In the previous episode, I said that the M in M. Bison stands for Mighty, because that's how he refers to himself in Street Fighter 4, but when I was going back through Street Fighter Alpha 3, I completely forgot that people referred to him as Master Bison, and, uh, yeah, that makes way more sense, so my bad, I completely forgot about this. So anyway, Cam is a clone. And I could keep going, there's so many unique character interactions that flesh these fighters out in their relationships. Adon becomes obsessed with finding Akuma because he wants to learn the Raging Demon. Guy and Rose develop a close bond as he tries to keep her from going on a suicide mission to take out Bison. And if you fight Juni and Julie, you see all the other dolls that serve Bison pop up for a second. And even though they're only here for that one shot, each of these characters would return later on. It is wild how much this game fleshed out the lives of these characters, making it feel like even if a character wasn't one of the big faces of the series, they still fit into their own corner of this world and mapped out how these characters would develop in the future. By the way, in case you're wondering why Bison is alive in Street Fighter 2 when his body is vaporized in Alpha, it's because A, as I said, the canon of Street Fighter Alpha 3 is very loose. But it's also because Shadowloo makes clone bodies for Bison that he can keep putting his spirit inside. And as long as a tiny piece of his soul remains, in this case the piece that's put inside of Rose, then he can keep reviving himself. Yeah, Capcom really loves their villains with backdoor plans that help them repeatedly escape death. But there you have it, that is Street Fighter Alpha 3, a game that provided more replayability and more variety than any other fighting game Capcom had produced at the time. And the crazy thing is, it wouldn't stop there. Because that's just what you got in the arcade release. But when it comes to the home releases, Street Fighter Alpha 3 would put Super Turbo to shame in terms of how many different versions and updates this game got. When Alpha 3 came to the PlayStation in December of 98, middle of 99 for the rest of the world, they added multiple new characters. Balrog, Juni, and Julie now all had their own story modes, but we also got DJ, Gal, Feilong, Evil Ryu, Shinakuma, and T-Hawk, who actually adds some important points to this story. He's chasing the M. Bison because multiple members of his tribe have gone missing, including a young girl named Julia. So, I wonder what could possibly have happened to her. I wonder if the Shadowloo doll Julie might be able to provide some answers about what happened to- Oh my god, it's her! Yes, Julie was a member of the Thunderfoot tribe, and in this game, T-Hawk is able to rescue her, although it takes several years for her to recover from her brainwashing and return to normal. Although in Street Fighter 6, there is a happy ending to all this, because it's eventually revealed that not only did she recover from her brainwashing, but she and T-Hawk even got married. However, as nice as these new characters were, that's not the big appeal of the home console version of Alpha 3. No, it was around this time that arcades were starting to die down. The surge of popularity of home consoles was starting to eat away at arcades' businesses, and many developers realized if they were going to stay in business, they needed to figure out a way to bring fighting games into people's homes meaning they need to give them a reason to pay full price. They needed more single-player content. And so Alpha 3 introduced a mode called World Tour. In this mode, you pick a character, and then you travel across the globe, choosing which destination you want to go to, with each location contain unique fights, many of which have additional challenges to them beyond just defeating the opponent. 
and after being a certain number of fights, you'll unlock buffs that you can give your character, and you can power yourself up in so many different ways. This created tons of customization as well as replayability because you would be tempted to find out how different you could build your character. You'd want to see if you could make them stronger so that way you could go further and take on bigger enemies. Or maybe different characters might benefit from different builds, so you'd want to go in there and start fresh with someone brand new. This is a genius idea, and people loved it. Over the years, I've heard so many people's positive memories for World Tour Mode, and showed how forward-thinking Capcom was when it came to the changing marketplace of fighting games at the time. At least with this one specific game. Uh, yeah, let's put a pin in that for now, but uh, just remember I said it. However, the Alpha Train doesn't stop there, because in 2002, it would go to the Game Boy Advance under the name Street Fighter Alpha 3 Upper. And this port is insane, because you would assume that this massive beefy game would never be able to fit on the Game Boy unless you had to make some significant cuts. And yet, quite the opposite happened. The Game Boy Advance port of this game was handled by Crawfish Interactive, a UK-based developer, and in 2013, Crawfish's founder Cameron Shepard talked about the making of this port in an interview with Nintendo Life. And, uh, hoo boy! This kind of brings the whole Alpha story to a nice bookend, because just like with Alpha 1, the story of the making of this port sounded like a nightmare. I'll spare you all the details, but among the many problems that this port had, they had no idea how hard it was going to be to compress this game down to the Game Boy, they had about six other games that were in development at the time, and when Capcom tested this game, they sent back a list of bugs to fix, all in Japanese, and nobody at the company spoke Japanese. Because of all these problems, the beta to completion process of this game took Crawfish three times longer than they had predicted, and as a result, the game failed to hit the Christmas 2001 deadline that Capcom gave them and had to be delayed until late the next year. Which, hey, it's good that they delayed it. You should always delay a game until it's fixed. But just because Capcom gave them more time didn't mean they weren't going to take something away in return. To punish Crawfish for this delay, Capcom withheld the final payments from them, and then they cut them out of the royalty deal for this game that they had promised them. And Crawfish kind of needed both of those things to keep them from going under. Yeah, sadly, Crawfish is no more, shutting down in November of 2002, literally a month before the North American release of this game. But as sad as that story is, I've got to applaud Crawfish because they made a darn good port. This is a shockingly good adaptation of the main game. And what makes it even wilder is that they weren't just shrinking the main game down, they had to add additional content in here because this version of the game would include three brand new characters. Yeah, one of the largest rosters of any fighting game at this point in time was being shrunk down to something that you could fit in your pocket, and then it got even bigger. But I'll hold off on talking about these three new characters because they would also appear in the next and final version of this game, Street Fighter Alpha 3 Max for the PSP, which was released in 2006. Yes, eight years after the original release of this game, it got another brand new update for the PSP, and this is a dream game. This is one of those installments that fighting game fans to this day keep asking Capcom to bring back, because the phrase, the complete package, doesn't do this game justice. First off, every character is back, including the three new characters from the Game Boy version. These characters were Eagle from the first Street Fighter, he's a bouncer who's traveling the world looking for strong fighters, a really basic premise, but you know what? I actually kind of love Eagle, because sure, I want to fight strong opponents is generic fighting game motivation number one. But there's something about seeing a British guy with this cleanly trimmed mustache and perfectly pressed suit and suspenders, but they're still built like a brick house and they just want to beat up everyone they see. I don't know, it works for me, I kind of love it. Then there's Maki, another big fan favorite character from Final Fight. She's another student of the Bushinryu clan, and because of that, she shares a lot of similar running attacks with Guy. However, she's less stoic and serious compared to Guy. Instead, she's a rough and tumble tomboy who is constantly trying to prove herself as the best. Then there's Yoon Lee. Who is Yoon Lee? Well, at the moment, he's nobody because he technically doesn't exist yet. Yeah, Yoon was a character introduced in Street Fighter 3, who Capcom retroactively added into Street Fighter Alpha 3. Although, I can pretty much guarantee you that his appearance in here isn't canon, because according to the Street Fighter timeline, Yoon would be like 8 years old when this game happened. 
So I'll go into more details about him when we get to the game where he was actually first introduced. Now these are three pretty odd choices for new characters. I mean, Eagle and Maki continue the theme of these games, adding new Street Fighter 1 and Final Fight characters, so I guess they make sense. But Yoon? Why would you add a Street Fighter 3 character? Well, simply because Capcom already had the data for these three characters all ready to go. Because all three of these characters were in Capcom vs SNK2, which was released in August 2001. So I'm guessing that Capcom requested that Crawfish add them to the Game Boy Advance version, which was supposed to come out in December of that same year, so that way they could get some nice cross-promotion going on. But the PSP version of the game would see one more character add to the roster, because after taking the sprites from Capcom vs SNK2, Capcom looked around the office and realized they still had one more character sprite just laying around that they had yet to copy and paste into a brand new game. And so they include Ingrid from Capcom Fighting Evolution. And if you want to know more about Capcom Fighting Evolution, we did a whole retrospective on, and you can find that in the card that's popping up right now. So Ingrid is a weird case because she started off as basically a superhuman with immortality in a cancelled Capcom fighting game, then she got put into the Capcom crossover fighter Capcom Fighting Evolution as a god, and then she got added to Alpha 3 Max because as I said, Capcom already had the data for her just laying around, might as well do something with it. Unfortunately, many fans did not agree with this decision, because since Ingrid is meant to be a god, her story is all about her saying that psycho power was her creation, it came from her, and she's come down to Earth to punish Bison for misusing it. So she basically stomps Bison down, scolds him like a child, and then easily wipes him out. And a lot of people had a problem with this because yeah, people don't really tend to take kindly to a brand new character popping up and then just easily dismissing the big tough guy of the series. She even cures Ryu of the Satsui no Hado because, eh, she had some time, why not? And considering that the director of this PSP game, Hidetoshi Ishizawa, was also the planner on Capcom Fine Evolution, a lot of people view this as somebody taking their OC and putting them into another story just so that that way they can be better than all the other characters despite the fact that Ishizawa didn't actually create Ingrid. Yeah, listen, I get why people don't like this arcade ending, but guys, it's a guest character in the spin-off of a spin-off of the third version of a game in which nobody's arcade ending is canon. If you're giving this arcade ending anything more than an eye roll, you're exerting too much effort and you need to readjust your priorities. There are far more important things that you can focus your anger towards. But I think most people just hate Ingrid because they're told they should hate Ingrid. I think the majority of people who hate her have never played this game and barely know she exists. They've just heard some content creators say that you should hate her, so they do. But she is not that important and this ending is not a big enough deal to actually be worth the kind of hate that I have seen for this character. People still complain about Ingrid today in 2023 is like someone complaining about that time that you got pickles on your burger 10 years ago. You gotta let it go, man. But okay, now that we have addressed the elephant in the room, let's talk about everything else that makes this version of the game so impressive. Alpha 3 Max had so many modes, more than 90% of any other fighting game coming out at that time. World Tour Mode returns, Dramatic Battle returns, but now there's also Reverse Dramatic Battle where you take on two characters at once. Then there's the Versus 100 Kumite where you have to make your way through 100 opponents. Then there's something called Variable Battles where you get to pick two characters but instead of both of them being on screen at once like in Dramatic Battles, now you can swap between them like this is Marvel vs. Capcom. And after Alpha 3 came to home consoles, they fixed the arcade mode so that you no longer lose the whole game if Bison beats you, but in the PSP version, they did include a special mode where you can just challenge Bison right away and if you lose, then it goes right into Bison's ending just like in the arcade. So yeah, the PSP version of this game is insane, it's jam-packed with so much content, so many characters, so many modes, it's one of the richest, fullest Street Fighter experiences ever. Here's the problem. It's only on the PSP. I mean, unless you have a friend who also has a PSP and also owns Alpha 3 Max and happens to be standing within a five foot radius of you, you can't actually fight other people in this fighting game. This is why people have asked Capcom for some kind of a port of this game. 
There's so much content on here, it's unfair to keep it locked on a tiny portable PlayStation. I mean, we did get some decent arcade ports of the Alpha games for the Street Fighter 30th anniversary. And that 40th anniversary is closing in, it'll be here before you know it. Maybe we could finally get some kind of an ultimate Alpha port? And if we do that, how about you include the bonus content from the PS2 Alpha Collection? Yeah, Alpha 3 Max is the final new version of Alpha 3, but on the PS2 Alpha Collection, there was an extra unlockable mode that was honestly so odd, I had to look up multiple videos on it to make sure the entire internet wasn't just trying to pull a prank on me. In the Street Fighter Alpha Anthology, if you beat every single game available on that collection, then you unlock Hyper Street Fighter Alpha. And this is only a training slash versus mode, there's no single player content on it, but it includes mode like Mazzy mode, where you do way more damage, but the opponent only needs to beat you once. And Psycho mode, named after Dan Hibiki's Psycho style martial art, where your characters do less damage, can't cancel moves together, and you get dizzy more easily. Essentially, it turns every character into a joke character. But there's also four more isms. Greenism, which gives every character Darkstalker style push blocks. Blueism, which lets your character do Street Fighter 3 style parries. Uh, spoiler alert for what's coming up. Yeah, in Street Fighter 3, they give your characters parries. Then there's Pinkism, which makes the Street Fighter 2 characters play like they did in Champion Edition, so bigger damage but no supers. And then Redism, which makes it so that any of the characters that appeared in the Marvel vs. Capcom games just play like they did in the Versus games. And then there's so many other smaller changes that you can alter yourself in the menus that get so technical I can't even begin to explain them. I am telling you Capcom, you got four more years before the 40th anniversary, a Street Fighter Alpha 3 Ultimate Edition with every single one of these modes and updates would be the holy grail of crazy retro fighting game ports. But that is it. That is the complete history of the Alpha series. A game that started almost as a throwaway, something just to get some hardware out the door, with almost no time being given to the devs because Capcom just wanted something to get made now. But the developers were so passionate about this, and the combat adjustments and the art style and the presentation spoke so much to so many people that it just kept growing and growing until it became one of the biggest fighting games that Capcom had ever made or would ever make. This is an amazing achievement for this series and deserves the spot that it has in people's hearts. However, there was one massive problem that people had with the Alpha series that I haven't addressed yet. It wasn't called Street Fighter 3. Yeah, people waited years and years for a sequel to Street Fighter 2. Everyone else was getting sequels. Tekken was getting sequels. Mortal Kombat was getting sequels. King of Fighters had a brand new game coming out every single year. So even if this was a new Street Fighter, people needed that number. They needed to actually see the number three up there. Well, Alpha 1 came out in 1995, and even though people might have been disappointed that this wasn't a true sequel, they wouldn't have to wait much longer. Because the very next year, in 1996, players would finally be introduced to Street Fighter 3. D. 3D. This was a Street Fighter with 3D graphics. This was not what people were asking for. Alpha. So if you remember from the last episode, Street Fighter 2 was created by one of the largest teams that Capcom had ever put on a game up to that point, with many brand new talents coming on board, but that doesn't mean that they stuck around with the company. No, back in the 90s, video game developers were shuffled around like decks of cards, moving on to different games, being traded at different companies, or even starting up their own company. 
And that was the case for Akira Nishitani, one of the players for Street Fighter 2, and if you'll remember from the last episode, was also the guy who talked Yoshiki Okamoto out of giving Chun-Li a smaller health bar just because she was a woman, meaning he ended up saving this entire franchise from being really uncomfortable to talk about. Well, in 1995, Akira Nishitani would leave Capcom and start up his own company, Arika, which, as you can probably guess, was named by shifting around the letters in Akira's own name. Now, even though Nishitani left Capcom, they didn't leave on bad blood. In fact, the two of them decided to work together on Arika's very first game. Nishitani wanted to pursue making games using three-dimensional polygons, and there were many people at Capcom who also expressed interest in this. But if you remember from way back in our Rival Schools retrospective, Noritaka Funamizu stated that he did not believe that Capcom was capable of making 3D fighting games at that time. So, on one side, you have a former Street Fighter developer who wanted to make 3D games. Then you had Capcom saying they wanted to make 3D fighting games, but they didn't know how to do it. Well, those two goals overlapped, and Nishitani was able to convince Capcom to let him make a brand new Street Fighter game under his brand new company, which would include several brand new characters owned entirely by Arika. That's how you know that Nishitani and Capcom were still in good graces. Capcom actually said, yeah, you can use any character of ours that you want, but at the same time create a bunch of brand new characters that we will have no say in, and we're not going to own any of this. Can you imagine any modern day giant video game studio making a deal that sweet? Oh, what's that? Hideo Kojima has split off from Konami, but he still wants to make Metal Gear games and he wants to own everything new that he creates for that game? Sure, I don't see anyone objecting to that. And so the team at Arika got to work on this brand new Street Fighter game, Street Fighter EX, which would release in arcades in 1996. And after being put in charge of this new project, Nishitani learned, oh crap, making a 3D game is indeed as hard as everyone at Capcom said it would be. In an interview with Gamus Magazine in 1997, Nishitani talked about how they had tried to make a 3D game that could still work with 2D mechanics, and after listing off the many differences between those two formats, he came to the conclusion, quote, Controlling all that was way more strenuous than we had expected, and we worried about it right up until the very end. Unfortunately, we ultimately came to the conclusion that it's impossible to make something in 3D that works exactly the same as something in 2D. And as he was saying this, somewhere off in the distance, you could hear Funamizu laying out the biggest I told you so in the history of Capcom. And that was the biggest shock to me when I finally played this. The Street Fighter EX games aren't exactly the 3D game I expected them to be. Yeah, I'll go ahead and admit, out of all the Street Fighter games to be released, outside of a handful of obscure browser game spinoffs, this is the only game I have never played until making this video. I never touched any of the EX games simply because whenever I saw them at the arcade, I just thought they looked kind of weird. I know that in the mid-90s, 3D was all the rage, and hey, I'll admit, I remember looking at those Tekken 1 cutscenes and being blown away by them. Again, I remind everyone this was in the 90s, but I didn't have anything else to compare Tekken characters to. With Street Fighter, I kept looking back and forth between the EX games and the crisp, clean sprites of the Alpha games as well as the Versus games, and I kept thinking, this doesn't look that good. And I only got to go to the arcades once every other week, I wasn't about to waste that short time that I had on something that wasn't immediately winning me over. So for this video, I'm going to be playing the PlayStation port of the game, which of course isn't a 100% accurate port considering the hardware limitations. However, it's a lot closer than you might think. You see, Street Fighter EX wouldn't run on Capcom's arcade hardware. Instead, it would run on the Sony ZN1, which was based on the hardware of the Sony PlayStation. So while graphically it might be a little bit lacking, it's still a pretty decent representation of the original game. And after playing this for the very first time, I learned this isn't really a 3D fighter. Yeah, it uses three-dimensional figures and stages, but aside from a few handful of actions like rolling on Wake Up, the stage doesn't shift all that often and you're still mostly fighting on a two-dimensional plane. However, these 3D models did get to show off their full figures in certain actions, such as throws and a handful of supers where the camera would whip and zip around, and when you do win around, the game shows you a replay of what you just did, but rather than just picking an angle and sticking with it, the game tries to chop together different angles and zooms around to try and make it look like somebody just edited together all your gameplay into a sizzle reel, and uh... Well, sometimes it looks okay. 
So while technically this is a 3D fighter, for 90% of the game, it's still kind of a 2D game. But they still decided to give this game a unique combat mechanic that was completely independent of any specific graphical dimension. You have three bars of super, and each character has multiple supers that they can use, but you can cancel any super into any other super. Now, not every character has three supers, most of them only have two, but many of them are designed to specifically link into each other. Like you'll have a super that launches you and the opponent into the air, and then you have another super that only works when you're in the air. Doesn't take you too long to figure out what you're supposed to do with those two. And when you successfully cancel one super into another, it feels fantastic. It's one of the best things about this game. But as for the rest of the combat, it feels... fine. It's not bad, but it is a bit clunky. Stuff still combos together alright, but not well enough to be worth commenting on. And certain moves just feel weird now. It feels like they tinker with some stuff just so it could be different. For example, Ryu's Tatsumaki is now a Rekka move, and you have to keep inputting the down-back kick motion to do more than one hit. And considering that Ryu has a super that is done by hitting down-back, down-back kick, yeah, you can see how that would be a problem. And while we're talking about supers, I mentioned earlier how famous the Raging Demon move would become, despite its very odd input pattern. Yeah, light punch, light punch forward, light kick, heavy punch, that's not really an input that rolls off the tongue. But considering it's that strong and it's unblockable, it's worth it and the animation for it has such an impact that you can totally understand why so many people love it. And you know who really loved it? Nishitani and all the developers at Arika. There are three characters on the original arcade release of EX who had Raging Demons. Five on the updated version, EX Plus, that would be released the next year, and six on the PlayStation version, released just a few months after that. And I don't just mean there's six characters with the same unique input. No, they all start off by running across the screen, grabbing you, and then the screen cuts to a bunch of flashes and you do big damage. They're literally all just raging demons. Also, before we get off the combat, there was one more unique mechanic that this game came up with, a guard break, where you can spend one bar of your super mirror to do an attack that won't just break your opponent's guard, but it will also stun them, leaving them wide open for an attack. A lot of people have complained about this over the years, but I think it's all right. Granted, I was just playing against the computer. I'm sure that pro players can abuse the hell out of this thing, but I didn't find it to be too much of a problem. And I do think that spending the bar of your super meter is a decent price to pay for it. But at this point, you're probably wondering, who the heck are these new characters? There is a whole new cast of characters added to the Street Fighter universe with this game. Kind of. For legal reasons, Arika still owned them, meaning as soon as the EX games were done, they could never cross over with Street Fighter again. But for the time being, this was a huge expansion for the World Warriors. So, who was our roster for this game? Well, on the original release from the classic Street Fighter team, there was Ryu, Ken, Chun-Li, Gao, and Zangief. At the time, they were probably the five most standard Street Fighter characters you could come up with. But as for the new Arika-owned characters, there was Hokuto, a woman who was born through the affair of two royal houses, and now she was stuck between the two of them and was attempting to hunt down her long-lost brother to stop him from going down a dark and dangerous path. It's also mentioned that she inherited the teachings of the Bushinryu style, the same type of fighting that Guy and Maki use, but yeah, she doesn't play like either of them at all, so that's pretty much just their attire to the rest of Street Fighter. Hokuto is treated sort of as the face of the Arika side of this roster. She's constantly being matched up with Ryu in all the official art, so they were really pushing for her to be the face of this new company. Then there's Doctrine Dark. He was a soldier who served under Guile, but one day, his unit got into a conflict with another troop being led by Rolinto, and Dark was the only survivor. The stress of this battle caused something to snap inside of Dark, and he turned into a brutal serial killer, blaming Guile for sending his team to die. Next is Palamperna, the daughter of a wealthy Saudi Arabian businessman. Her father was hypnotized to serve Shadaloo, and now she's heading out to stop them. Then there's Cracker Jack. He's a Las Vegas bouncer who's dressed like an old-timey tough guy and is currently on the run from a gang of mobsters. I love Cracker Jack. His fist gets giant when he attacks and he pulls out a bat for one of his specials to send you flying into the outfield. 
He fights like how a fighting game character made in the 1940s would fight. Also, the criminal organization chasing Cracker Jack down is never named, but in his ending, you do get to see him punching a shadowloo controlled train off the track, so go ahead and feel free to jump to conclusions. And lastly, there's the most famous character Arika would ever create, Skullamania. Even if you have never heard of this series, you've still probably heard of Skullamania because his popularity was running wild. Skullamania was a car salesman and a bad one at that. So bad that in order to keep his job, he had to volunteer to dress up as a superhero to bring in customers, but after dressing up as a hero, he felt a greater calling, and then quit his job to run off and fight crime. Yes, yeah, Skullamania is here to give this roster a big dose of humor, and he gets the job done. Now, Skullamania was based around the Japanese hero Kamen Rider, although there are several other stories about him also being based around real-life luchador La Parka. But in that Gamist interview I mentioned, Arika's Vice President Ichiro Mihara said that originally Skullamania was going to be, quote, a rubber man. Uh, not like that. He originally was going to be in a very SM style rubber suit, and Mihara hated that and demanded they changed it. He didn't want him to look like he was made of rubber, so the artist decided, alright, what's the opposite of rubber? Oh, I got it. Bones. Screw it. Cover him in bones. And so, a great tragedy was barely avoided, and a hero was born. Now, when you start the game up, these are all the characters that you get, but there are five unlockable characters. M. Bison is the normal boss, but if you make it to him without losing a round, then once again, Akuma comes in and does what he does best. It's on you. By the way, I knew about Akuma in Super Turbo. I knew about Akuma in Alpha in Alpha 2. I didn't know about Akuma in EX, so when he came sliding in, it did genuinely shock me. And just like in Super Turbo, and just like in Alpha, he is the cheapest, meanest, secret boss that you can picture, and he's going to beat you like a drum. But there are four more original Arika characters hidden in this roster. There's Blair, the daughter of a wealthy European family who decided rather than dedicating her time to the finer things in life, she would instead dedicate all of her time to getting as swole as possible. She's friends with Palm and joins her to save her dad, and she's the one who hires Cracker Jack as her bodyguard, and the two of them end up developing something of a romantic relationship as this series goes on. And speaking of Palm, next up is Doran Mister, a wrestler from India who Palm hires to help her get her father back, and he agrees in the hopes that maybe he can run into Zangief and then test his muscles against his. Then there's Alan Snyder, a former American martial arts champ. He was defeated by Ken Masters, so he decided to invent his own form of martial arts that mimic Ken, Shoryuken, and Hadouken. He is also heavily inspired by Chuck Norris, and many people say that Arika's characters all have a 1970s martial arts movie vibe to them, and I think a lot of that comes from Alan Snyder. And lastly, Kairi, the long-thought-dead brother of Hokuto, who has spent the last 10 years with Amnesia, wandering the world with only a desire to fight and to test his limits. And with a description like that, I'm sure you're all shocked to learn he's one of the characters with a raging demon. And as for the bosses, I mentioned M. Bison is the regular boss and Akuma is a secret boss, but there's one more. If you get to M. Bison without losing a match, and finishing off every single match with a super move, then you come face to face with the brand new character, Garuda. Garuda was a man who was corrupted and turned into an evil spirit that ended up possessing a suit of armor. A suit of armor that appears to be made entirely of spikes. He now continues to live on by absorbing the negative emotions of those he fights, and the updated version of this game, when he became a playable character, he has an arcade ending seeing him standing side by side with Akuma and Evil Ryu, which I think is just Arika trying to say he's just as bad as they are, but it also gives off this feeling like maybe he's connected to the Satsui no Hato. Now, those are the characters in the arcade release, but as I mentioned, the next year, in March of 1997, a new version of the game, EX Plus, would be released, and it would include playable versions of the bosses, but would also include Evil Ryu, as well as Bloody Hokuto, a dark version of Arika's protagonist to match Ryu's dark side. Bloody Hokuto is Hokuto going full Manchurian candidate, as her father implanted an assassin persona into her through some ancient ninja magic, which would come out whenever she eventually fought her brother Kairi. 
And there were two more characters added to this version, although calling them characters is being kind of generous. Cycloid Beta and Cycloid Gamma are two blank figures who just use moves from other characters in the game, one taking moves from Street Fighter characters, one taking moves from the Eureka characters. Although there is something worth noting about them. In the story, they were created by Palm's brainwashed father to be robots for Shadowloo that could use moves from other fighters. Which is actually a thing that would come up in the actual Street Fighter canon in later games. 99% chance it's just a coincidence, but it's still fun to think about the possible connection here. But there was one more version of the game, as in July of 97, this game would come to the PlayStation as Street Fighter EX Plus Alpha. This included many of the modes that you would come to expect from home ports of fighting games, although it is worth pointing out that there is an expert mode where you have to perform certain trials, making this one of the earliest home fighting game releases that actually came with combo trials. But it also included two more fighters, Dalsim and Sakura. I mentioned that people loved Sakura when she first appeared, and the fact that she is literally the only alpha character to make it into this game kind of says a lot. Heck, Ariga loved her so much, guess what? They also gave her a raging demon. I repeat, Sakura has a raging demon in this game. Speaking of Sakura, while the first EX game might not have looked all that great and the gameplay was just okay, one compliment I have to give it is the music. This game's soundtrack is great, and even if you have never played it, I can guarantee you've probably heard some of these tracks. I can't tell you how many FGC content creators I've heard use Hokuto or Bison's themes, both of which are great, but Sakura's theme takes the cake. And thanks to one Maximilian dude, I can guarantee that her theme is going to outlive everything else in this game. The last physical copy of EX will crumble to dust, and we're all still going to have this stuck in our heads. Round one, fight! I guarantee about a dozen of you right now just shout out, Oh, that's where that's from! And so that was Street Fighter EX, a bold experiment for Capcom and Eureka, but it definitely feels like a first attempt. It feels like they needed more time to cook. Well, luckily, the next year in 1998, they would get that time, as they would then release Street Fighter EX 2, and this was a vast improvement. Graphically speaking, it isn't a huge leap in quality, but it is a bump nonetheless. Again, I am playing this on the PlayStation, but while the last game looked like what you would expect out of a PlayStation 1 fine game, this one feels a little bit closer to PS2 quality. The characters look a little bit more detailed and smoother. And speaking of smoother, the combat flows so much better than in the last game. A lot of the clunkiness I described is gone. This game now actually feels pretty darn good to play. And as for the mechanics, the guard break and the super canceling from the last game returned, but now there was a brand new ability known as the XL combo. And this is essentially the Alpha 2 style custom combo. You spin one bar meter and now you're suddenly moving faster and you can combo together moves that normally wouldn't connect. You think Sagat spamming Tiger Shot in Street Fighter 2 was bad? Check this out. Oh god, I hate it and I love it at the same time. Also, your super meter still goes up to three bars, so you can combo up to three supers into each other. But now, every character got a big cinematic level three super, which might be the first time I have ever seen the concept of a cinematic super or a level three super. This would become a staple in quicker, more anime-style fine games such as the Versus series, Dragon Ball Fighters, heck, even in Street Fighter VI. But this might be the first time that the term Level 3 Super was ever used to describe a big cinematic super. And some of these moves actually look pretty good. And some of them look goofy as hell, such as this one, which I will now play for you in its entirety.
What words could I have possibly said before showing you that to mentally prepare you for what you just watched? Oh, and as ridiculous as that move was, guess what? It was another raging demon. Yes, even more characters got raging demons in this game, including Chun-Li. Although her raging demon isn't a super move, it's just this. Yeah, if you input the command for a raging demon on Chun-Li, all she does is just apologize. Which I almost feel like that has to be a joke. It's like the developers realized so many characters had raging demons that people were probably going to just start randomly inputting the commands for it to see what happened. So if you do that on Chun-Li, she just apologizes. So it feels like she's apologizing that she just doesn't have a raging demon. Sticking with the gameplay, there were some changes made to the arcade ladder, just like in Street Fighter 1 and 2, there were now bonus stages in the middle of the arcade run, although they're very different from anything we had seen before. The first one has you going up against a training dummy with a set amount of life, and you have to use three bars of meter to try and KO them, but you're only allowed to use XL combos, which is way harder than it sounds. If you're playing a character who you know, then it's not that bad. But otherwise, you might want to practice before going up against this train dummy. And the second bonus stage sees you having to beat up a satellite. Yeah, Street Fighter 2 had you beating up a car, now you're in space beating up a satellite. That is one hell of an escalation. But it kind of plays into this game's themes. There's a whole space motif behind this game. For example, if you finish a match with a super, then you see plants and asteroids just start raining down behind you. But here's what makes these bonus stages really interesting. Most fighting games with bonus stages only have them there for flavor or for points, but outside of the arcades, getting a high score doesn't really matter all that much. However, in EX2, these bonus stages actually give you, get this, a bonus. If you manage to beat the Excel combo challenge, then the next round, you can do unlimited Excel combos without it eating up your meter. Kinda nuts, right? That's nothing. If you destroy the satellite, which is incredibly easy to do by the way, then you get unlimited meter for 20 seconds. 20 seconds might not sound like much, but I started the next round off by immediately doing two level 3 supers, and I just instantly won. Yeah, these bonuses are broken, maybe a little bit too broken in fact, but I do love the idea of bonus stages in arcade runs actually helping you in the rest of the arcade run. This is something I wish more games would experiment with. So the combat is immensely better. In fact, like with the Alpha series, most people I've spoken to say the second installment is the best in this series. But what about the roster? Well, this is where it gets weird because just like with the first EX game, there were multiple arcade releases and a home release, each of which had totally different cast. Okay, the original arcade release was Ryu, Ken, Chun-Li, Zangief, Guile, and Dawson returning, but now they're joined by Vega and Blanca. But as for the Eureka characters, Hokuto, Skullmania, Doctrine Dark, and Crackerjack all return along with two brand new characters. There's Sharon, a nun by day and secret agent by night who is searching for her family. She mostly fights with guns and just speaking personally, I found her to be one of the less interesting characters. She's got a super where she just loads a bullet into her gun. That's it, that's the entire super. And then if you want to use that bullet, that's a totally different super. So in order to do one attack, which does slightly above average damage, you have to do two supers. Yeah, I'm not the biggest fan. And then the other new character was Hayate, a swordsman whose family had been tasked with slaying the evil snake deity Orochi. Huh. That's weird, why are SNK's lawyers calling? Now that was the main roster, but there were four secret characters. Garuda returns as an unlockable character and as the boss. Kairi also returns from the last game, although he's gone down a very dark path. Now he's got white hair, he's acting more savage, and he has some flat out broken supers that do massive damage, but they also hurt him in return. He is quite literally a glass cannon. Then the last two unlockable fighters are brand new. There was Nanase, the younger sister of Hokuto, and Shadowgeist, who is a vigilante fighting against the dictatorship of his home country that killed his family, 
And Axe is something of a rival to Skull Mania, because when I think of two things that make for natural enemies, it's freedom fighters and car salesmen going through midlife crises. Seriously though, when you look at Shadow Guy's outfit, it becomes pretty clear he was meant to be the darker version of Skull Mania, which is made even more apparent by his moveset. Just look at his level 3 super, he pulls a Hakai and erases you from existence. Skull Mania is in way over his head on this one. Although, speaking of Skull Mania, he kind of blew up after the first game, and Arigo realized this, and they started slapping him all over the promotion for this game, including on this poster, which might be the weirdest bit of official Street Fighter media ever created. Skull Mania and a bunch of the other Street Fighter characters who have now all been turned into their own Skull Mania are about to operate on a naked Ryu. Presumably so they can also skull mania him. Who? Who submitted this? Was this something that Arika did without consulting Capcom? Was this somebody's kink drawing that the boss found so they had to pass it off as if it was concept art? I have many questions, but I don't think I want any answers. In fact, you know what? I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. The EX games might have the weirdest advertising in the entire Street Fighter series. When the first game was initially coming out, they decided to advertise it with this. Yes, who wouldn't get excited to play a game after seeing your favorite fighters being horrified by their own Cronenbergian transformation into jagged 3D polygons? But moving back to the roster, the next year Street Fighter EX2 Plus would be released in arcades. M. Bison Return, with the boss now being a more powerful version of him called Bison 2, Pulumperna and Darren would also return, but as for the new characters, Sagat joined the Street Fighter side, and on the Arika side, there was Volcano Rosso, a suave Italian fighter with volcanic powers who was fighting against a mysterious criminal organization that killed his wife. A lot of dead family members on the Arika side, aren't there? And lastly, and arguably the least well received Arika character, Arya. She's a high tech whiz kid super genius who created a super powered gauntlet that she calls Cancer. I'm going to assume it was named after the crab. Also, to skip ahead here a bit, part of her backstory is that she thinks all this fight is some kind of a game or sci-fi simulation and that all the other fighters are just robots. And in EX3, it says that she starts picking them apart only to find that they're made of skin and bones, but rather than accepting what she's done, she retreats further into fantasy. So yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. But looking at her playstyle, it's very interesting. She can fire out her glove or set it on the ground as a trap. She uses that glove for a whole bunch of her moves. But most importantly, her big level 3 super attack is so powerful, it can almost wipe out the opponent's entire life. But the downside of that is that after she uses it, her gauntlet breaks and it stays broken for the rest of the match. Not the round! No, if you do this in round one, round two is you going out there without your glove, meaning half your moves are gone. Fighting games are all about risk versus reward, and yes, that is a lot of damage, but oh my goodness, that is a huge risk. So those were the characters added to EX2+, Plus, but oddly enough, not everyone from EX2 Vanilla would return. Hayate was now absent from the cast. This guy got introduced in EX2, then got removed from the updated version of the game just a year later, only to then return for the home release of the game because Arika wanted to make this as confusing as possible. Although speaking of the home release, again, that's why I'm playing for this video, and I've compared footage of this to actual arcade releases, and again, it seems like a pretty good port. And considering all the advancements made between EX and EX2, that's quite a feat for the little OG PlayStation. Although there is something that was cut from the English version of this game. Character endings. Don't get me wrong, there weren't any ending cutscenes like in the last game, just a small box of text, but in the English version, that box is gone and it's now replaced with a simple thank you for playing. And if I haven't made it clear on this channel before, arcade modes without endings aren't arcade modes. They're just time attack or survival mode, but with less rules. Also should point out that while the home console version of EX came with a bunch of brand new characters, I mentioned that this version added back in Hayate, but aside from that, there really isn't a whole lot of extra content for the home console release. There's this minigame where you can break barrels, which is a callback to the classic bonus games from Street Fighter 2, 
Although thanks to this background and these graphics, it looks like Ryu got lost and somehow found his way into OG Donkey Kong. But funny little barrel breaking game aside, I think this new installment of the EX series was a massive bump in quality. The gameplay is faster with really interesting combo potential, largely thanks to the balance adjustments from the first game as well as the Excel combos. As I said, many people consider this to be the best of the EX series, and if you're going to see any EX game get tournament play today, which admittedly is kind of rare, but if you do see that happen, it's probably going to be EX2. So then what happened with EX3? While Street Fighter EX3 would release in March 2000 in Japan, October the same year in North America, March 2001 in Europe, and in arcades, never. Yes, this was now a PlayStation 2 exclusive, even being a launch title in North America. And there's definitely a bump in quality thanks to the new hardware, but yeah, it's certainly aged poorly. Especially the backgrounds, when you stop and really look at them, some of these graphics get kinda wonky. Also, is that Mr. T? Yeah, I have... No idea what the story behind that is, but it's real. That is Mr. T in Street Fighter EX3. Form whatever headcan you want about it. Also, one other thing that I have to point out about the graphics is they decided to lose the whole space theme from the previous games, and now when you beat an opponent with a super move, you get treated to statues of deities flinging around in the background. I don't think Arika ever settled on a tone for these games. But you know what, they sure had some ideas, and I gotta give them credit for that. Now when it comes to the combat, there were plenty of changes, and I'm kind of 50-50 on whether or not they were for the better. The Excel combo, arguably the most fun mechanic of the last game, is now gone. Guard breaks from the previous games has now been altered, it no longer consumes your super meter, but also no longer breaks your guard. Instead, it is called the Surprise Blow, and it only stuns your enemy if it hits them. But as for the improvements to the gameplay, the EX series was known for letting you cancel supers into each other, but now you could cancel specials into each other as well, which definitely spices up the combo potential. And in the game's biggest change, EX3 featured tag battles, where you could play with a whole team that you could swap between, and if you time it just right, you can link one character coming out to continue the combo from the first character, which is really cool. I do believe that we would see this idea fleshed out and improved upon in later tag fighters, but that wouldn't be for many more years. At the time, this was really impressive. Speaking of team of attacks, specific characters in this roster will have special supers that they can perform side by side with specific other characters, and when you pull one of these off, it looks so cool. Seeing Ryu and Ken doing a combo side by side, Zangief and Doran bodying the opponent across the stage. This is a great idea, and I wish way more tag fires would do stuff like this. As for the more unique mechanics, when one of your characters is KO'd, your remaining character gets something called Emotional Flow, where now you can use your KO'd character's super gauge, meaning you can now have up to six super bars. And lastly, there's a mechanic called Critical Parade, where for two super meters, you can summon out both your characters at once to fight, and you get unlimited meter. This is insane. It also only lasts for like two seconds. So yeah, you can't just go out there and start mashing some buttons. You need to know exactly what you're doing in this situation. But if you do know what you're doing, oh, this is broken, but in the best ways possible. I can always appreciate some dumb fun in fighting games and Critical Parade is some dumb fun. <laughs> So there are tons of new moves and playstyles that make this a really interesting fighting game. 
But the problem is, a lot of these mechanics take some expert timing and encyclopedic knowledge of everything new this game provides you with to really capitalize on. And don't get me wrong, that's true for most fighting games. Most fighting games, the better you are at understanding it and the better your timing is, the more you're going to be able to do. That's obvious. But typically there's a progression. Typically there's people down there at the bottom who don't understand any of it. Then there are people who get some of it. Then there's people that get most of it. And then there's the Galaxy Brain players at the top who they know all the frame data, they know how to link every single thing together, they can see through time and they can manipulate the matrix. But EX3 throws so much at you that requires such good timing that it really only was a hit with the heavily skilled players and became something of a turnoff to the more casual players. When you listen to people talk about this game, big dedicated fighting game players will praise these mechanics. Everyone else will... Yeah, this game got pretty middling reviews upon release. And you can understand why. The PS2 came out, everyone was excited, and there was a brand new Street Fighter alongside it. Everyone got hyped for it, and it didn't look that good, and only about 2% of the population knew what they were doing in it. However, this might be one of the reasons why over the past couple of years, I've seen a small resurgence for this game. Now that more dedicated fighting game communities have started to sprout up, there's more people out there who are willing to experiment with this game and really see everything that I can do. I said throughout this series I wanted to spotlight other creators, so I highly recommend checking out the video that Gal Winquotes made about why he feels this game is misjudged. I'll be honest with you, I was originally a lot harsher on this game when I was writing this script, but then I saw his video and it made me realize, you know what? This game actually is pretty good. It's the Charlie Brown Christmas tree of fighting games. It's not a bad video game. It just needs a little love and attention, that's all. So yeah, go check out his video. Also because he'll show you what actual good EX3 gameplay looks like as opposed to the random button mashing that I am doing on the screen right now. I am nowhere near as good as him, so you'll be able to find all the crazy combo potential in his video. A card for that video is popping up right now and you can find it in the link in the description down below. However, the problems this game had reaching audiences went beyond the gameplay. Let's talk about the characters. Yes, each game in the EX series had big cast of new faces. These rosters were some of the most charming things about the entire EX series, and with the power of the PS2 behind it, EX3 was about to provide us with a brand new group of memorable scratch that there's nobody. Yeah, EX3 had no new characters from Arika or Street Fighter. It's just characters from the last game and a handful from the first. Well, okay, there is one new character. Kind of. This is Ace. He is a secret agent sent to infiltrate Shadowloo, and he's basically Taskmaster because he's got the unique ability to reproduce other fighters' moves. What does this mean? It means he starts with no moves of his own. Instead, you have to unlock other characters' moves that you can then equip onto him to fully customize Ace and fight however you want. Okay, this is actually a really cool idea. Problem is, the way you unlock these moves kinda sucks. You have to do trials with Ace, then take the currency that you earn in these trials to purchase the moves. Okay, that doesn't sound too bad. Here's why it's bad. The whole point of Ace is being able to customize him however you want, but after the basic intro challenges, the trials will require you to use specific moves. But they don't give you those moves in the trial meaning you are now forced to buy that specific move. So sure, once you have beaten all the trials and bought all the moves, you can now fully customize Ace. But if you know the specific stuff that you want to buy, or you're just curious about trying some stuff out, or you just want to go ahead and take Ace right into any of the other modes and start finding some other people with your fully customized character, too bad. They give you the ability to customize Ace, only to then reveal that you can't actually customize him until several trials down the road. For now, you have to follow this very specific path that they have laid out for you, so that freedom of customization is kind of an illusion. Oh, and while we're still on this cast, a third of the characters are unlockable, and you have to unlock them by beating the arcade mode without losing. So if you want all of them, that's nine perfect runs on arcade mode. I won't lie, I kind of dread having to unlock each of these characters because the arcade mode in EX1 was kind of rough, or at least Bison was. EX2 was easier, but I was still worrying about having to play through this thing over and over without being KO'd to get all these characters. 
Luckily for me, this is hands down the easiest game in not just the EX series, it might be the easiest Street Fighter I am going to end up playing in this entire retrospective. I set this game to easy difficulty just to make sure that I could unlock these characters, only to find that my opponents were basically punching bags. I know this was easy mode, but even by easy mode standards, this was way too simple. So I went up to normal difficulty, only to find it was still super easy, easier than most fighting games easy modes. So I said, you know what, screw it, and I went to hard difficulty, and it was a mild challenge, but I still had no problem beating this game. Even Shin Bison, the secret version of Bison that is only in the hard difficulty of this game, was still so easy, I took him out with no problem. And the arcade mode tries to be unique, it does, I gotta give it credit for that. It's now got a new challenge on every single stage. But the same new challenge every single time? The first match sees you going up against three characters all at once, but they have severely reduced health bars. Then, whoever is the last character that you defeat can then be recruited to your team. Then you and your newly recruited ally go up against two other characters, and again, whichever character is the last one that you defeat can join your team. Then you and one of your two new teammates fight Garuda together at the same time. You can then also recruit Garuda, however, I should point out that you can only have three teammates in your arcade run, so you can always tell any of these characters that you don't want them on your team and then save that spot for a later match. Not that there are many matches left, because after this there's a 2v2 match, then you fight Sagat, then you fight M. Bison. Now, I give this arcade ladder a lot of credit for trying to make each match some kind of a new gimmick and trying to create some variety by laying you recruit characters to your team, but the fact that it's the exact same pattern each time you go through arcade ladder, and it's so easy, makes this arcade ladder get really boring really fast. I kind of felt like after the second time that I beat arcade mode, I was just on autopilot when I was playing this. As I said, the unique matches are a good idea. Except this ladder is only 6 fights, and 3 of them are pre-assigned boss fights. Meaning there's only actually 3 unique fights in this entire arcade run. I ended up having to beat Garuda so many times, I started to feel bad for him. And as for the Bison fight, he's the big final boss, and yet he's probably the easiest fight in this entire game. Because you get to take him on with all 4 of your characters. Yeah, you and the three teammates you have recruited throughout this arcade run all go up against Bison. And this isn't like a KOF boss fight where they realize you're using multiple characters, so they beef up his difficulty to try and make it even out. No, Bison is just a regular enemy in this game, and you are taking him on with the equivalent of four times his life. I think this arcade ladder is another reason why this game was met with such harsh criticism. This game wasn't in arcades, it was just on the PS2. Meaning instead of playing other people, way more customers were playing this single player content. They were going through the arcade ladder again and again, and despite how much they tried to spice this ladder up, it's not great. Nothing sums up this arcade ladder more than the fact that as I was recording, at one point in time my capture software started to short out, and I thought I lost about an hour of footage. With any other game, if I lost an hour of footage, I'd start panicking. But here? Even as I was watching the footage fade away, I just thought, eh, nothing of value was lost. You see somebody go through the arcade ladder once, you've seen it a dozen times. Heck, Ariga even tried to spice up the credits by making you fight off waves of enemies during it. But I'll advise you to take off your headphones and turn down the volume real quick because you might actually go deaf listening to this. <laughs> Yeah, the credit fight is just that. Non-stop. I did this once and then skipped those credits each time after it. My point is, this arcade ladder just isn't that fun, so all the game really had was the combat, and if you're looking for a PS2 launch tile with really good tag-based combat, Tekken Tag Tournament came out at the exact same time, and yes, I do believe that this game is misjudged, I do believe it's better than a lot of people give it credit for, but it ain't no Tekken Tag Tournament. 
So yeah, while well, I give this game a ton of credit for everything that I tried with the combat and the way it attempted to make the game feel unique and different, it all just evens out to being fine. It's totally okay. And in the end, that's kind of how I feel about the EX series in general. It's got some interesting characters and some forgettable ones, and it's got some fun mechanics, but outside of the second game, none of them are really good enough to be worth hunting down. Unfortunately, the second game was the lowest selling one of the trilogy, meaning it goes for insanely high prices. Yet yeah, EX sold about 900,000 copies, EX3 sold about 400,000, EX2 sold only about 150,000. So, hey, good luck hunting down a copy at a reasonable price. Although it is worth pointing out all the ways that the EX games really trailblazed later games with 3D models. Things like cinematic supers and level 3 supers are now commonplace in many games, so I applaud the EX games for being so ahead of the times, and the EX games would end up living on, just without Street Fighter. At least for the most part. As I said, Capcom didn't own these games, it was a joint venture between them and Eureka. However, the two companies would keep a fairly good relationship with each other, as each of the Eureka characters would get official artwork and bios on Street Fighter's website just a few years ago, as well as getting costumes based on these characters added to Street Fighter V. But because Eureka still owned these original characters, they figured they should probably do something with them. So in December 1998, the same year that EX2 came out, they would put out Fighting Lair, their own game featuring many of the EX characters as well as several new characters including some guy dressed up as a Xenomorph. Yeah, the Fighting Lair games are weird, but I'll save all that for when we eventually do a Fighting Lair retrospective in... oh... let's say 2026? Yeah, let's go ahead and pencil that in. But back to Street Fighter, as you can see, the years following up Street Fighter 2 was something of an odd time for Capcom. The natural next step for this franchise was to make Street Fighter 3. It's the game that everyone was waiting on. And instead we got one weird diversion after another. We got prequels and 3D spin-offs and crossovers and yes, even a movie game. And that's not even mentioning the movies themselves and the cartoons, all of which we will cover in another episode. My point is, as good as these games might have been, people wanted more Street Fighter, but they specifically wanted Street Fighter 3. And because of that, I feel like at the time, people didn't appreciate these weird couple of years for Street Fighter. They looked at it as appetizers for the next big course. But since then, these games have gotten tons of recognition. The Alpha series is beloved, with many people listing these games as their favorites in the entire franchise. And even the EX games, as weird as they might seem looking back on them now, have started to see something of a resurgence as big fighting game fans have started to appreciate them on a brand new level. And these games were important to Street Fighter's development. The Alpha games fleshed out the lore and personality of these characters in a way that would serve as the foundation for everything we would know about them from this point on. And the EX games provide us with concepts like cinematic supers, level 3 supers, and tag-based gameplay mechanics that other games wouldn't even attempt until years later, making it a trailblazer that only now is finally being appreciated. But beyond all that, I also think this was a special time for Street Fighter, because it kind of captured what was so special about the mid-90s of fighting games. And that's that you could just get weird with them. So many games were coming out so often, and you tend to only hear people talk about how that led to an oversaturation, which, yeah, we'll get into that in the next episode. But it also meant we got unique games back then. You want to make a prequel to your game with a totally new art style and completely new playstyle? Sure, why not? Want this startup company to make a 3D version of your 2D game? Sure, it's the 90s. There is literally no idea we can't turn into a fighting game. These days, making any video game takes so much time and money that I feel like fewer people are willing to be weird, to take risk, and just try something completely different. So while this period of Street Fighter's life might not have been as big as what came before or what would come after, I still think it's a period that sums up what was so magical about fighting games in the mid-90s. But that means we have finally reached the next step for Street Fighter, the next generation. After all this time of waiting, players were finally about to get what they had been asking for. The most anticipated sequel in video game history was finally about to arrive. Street Fighter 3.
the game that would almost destroy the franchise. No! Thank you all for tuning in to part two of our ever-expanding Street Fighter retrospective. And before we go, I want to thank a few artists. I'm going to let you all in on a little behind-the-scenes info here. Originally, this video was going to be on Street Fighter Alpha, Street Fighter EX, and Street Fighter 3. But the video wound up being almost four hours long, and I know there are people out there who would love a four-hour-long video, but that's just too much. So I had to split it up, but we had already gotten the thumbnail art for the video, which was done by Danusco Campos on Twitter and Instagram. And I love this art, but as you can see, it's got Alpha and three characters on there, so sadly it just wouldn't work. But I still do really appreciate this, and you should all go and follow them. But I also want to give an equally big thanks to Mako Waco on Twitter and Tumblr. When I decided a week ago that I had to split this video up, I need a new thumbnail and I need it fast and Mako Waco made a great piece on very short nose and I really appreciate that. Go follow them as well. All of these links to all of these R's are going to be in the description down below. In fact, in every single video that we do, I always make sure to link to where you can find the R's who did the art down in the description. Always check for that. Always go out and support these artists. And of course, a thank you to all of you for sticking around and subscribing. Seriously, the support we got after the first video was insane and I am blown away by it. Sorry for making you wait so long in this second part. As I said, it was originally going to be twice as long. But the good news is that because I split this up, part three is going to be coming out much sooner. So make sure that you click that subscribe button and ring that bell so that way you know when it's coming. And you can follow me on Twitter for however long that continues to exist or on Instagram, Threads, and Tumblr, all at Thorgy's Arcade. And you can also find me on Twitch at Professor Thorgy. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you are on Twitch, you might want to go and follow us over there because coming up very soon is our annual week-long charity stream. So stay tuned for that. Thank you again for tuning in, everyone. Stay safe out there and come back next time. <laughs>